complicated. This session is going to be recorded and made available afterwards as well. Um, but I just wanted to start off by saying hello to everyone and thank you all for joining us for the next EDIG conference in 2022. And so I'm going to be starting off with a quick introduction to EDIG and sharing a short presentation. Um, and But before I get there, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes introducing myself and also just a quick thing about EDIG and its background. So my name is Aileen and I'm the Director of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion in Geosciences or EDIG project. Um, and we're really pleased to have you all here today with us. So the EDIG project originated from internal EDI conversations within a research centre, ICRAG, which quite a lot of the volunteers are based with. And so just before I introduce today's conference, I wanted to share a message from um, ICRAG's uh, director, Murray Hitzman, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us live today, but um, this is going to go smoothly and you should all be seeing this. Welcome to the EDIG conference on equity, diversity and inclusion in the geosciences. I'm Murray Hisman, director of the Science Foundation Ireland Research Center on Applied Geosciences, known as ICRAG. The seeds for this conference were planted in 2020 during the pandemic, when a group of ICRAG researchers set out to use the burgeoning virtual tools spurred by the pandemic to conduct a global survey to better understand the impact of prejudice, inequity, sexism, bias, exclusion and discrimination within the larger geoscience community. The excited response to their survey led them to hosting a virtual conference at the end of 2020. That conference then enabled further growth of the EDIG project and initiation of collaborations with a number of similar minded groups around the world. EDIG has now outgrown the ICRAG Center and is now a global network. This conference aims to extend EDIG's reach further by harnessing the collective power of the geoscience community to enact change for the benefit of all by promoting and improving the equity, diversity, and inclusivity within the geoscience community and beyond. We hope the conference will help all participants gain new knowledge and importantly, new contacts so that the community can continue to grow and thrive helping to ensure that we become a more inclusive society. The conference will be organized around three successive sessions that seek to answer, first, where have we come from? Second, where are we now? And finally, and perhaps more, most importantly, where are we going? While I unfortunately will not be able to attend due to another pressing meeting with our center's funding agency, I expect this conference will be a great success and result in a step change in our mutual understandings. I wish you all the best and the best of luck together answering these important, important questions. Cheers. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks Mary for that message and um, hopefully we'll be able to catch up on the recordings after. Um, so for the next few minutes, um, I'm just going to share a presentation. So, perfect. Hopefully you can all see this now. So um, yeah, I just wanted to give a little bit more detail about EDIG, where we came from, what are we trying to do and what we were trying to achieve, and also just give a few little bits of logistics before jumping into the conference. So overall, in terms of logistics, we do have a code of conduct for this event that will be posted in the chat box. Each of the session hosts is going to remind everyone about that at the start of each session. Um, but really, overall, we're trying to encourage a respectful in an open learning environment for all of us to come together to learn. So the EDA conference will also be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and captioning is also available. If uh, anyone has any issues accessing, accessing the captions, you can email us or just send a message in the chat box. Um, but our captions are being organized by Otter AI, which is supported through the um, National Science Policy Network, who are also sponsoring our Zoom access as well. So the chairs of each session will explain how the questions can be submitted, but there is um, a QA and a function at the bottom with Zoom webinar. And so if there are any issues, if Zoom crashes or anything like that, an email will be sent out to all participants through the Eventbrite account as well. Um, but overall, we really just hope everyone enjoys and uh, learns something from this event. So a little bit more about EDIG. Um, so EDIG is a volunteer-led initiative made up by people who want to learn more about the challenges of other geoscientists related to equity, inclusion and diversity, and really to help promote action to make geosciences more accessible and inclusive. 
So EDIG originated as a suggestion for a workshop for researchers around unconscious bias. But as this happened around the time of a global shift to a virtual platform, it was a really unique opportunity to move to a more global landscape and really include more people in the conversation. So this led to the design of a free and virtual conference back in 2020, um, but really to gain the understanding of these challenges experienced by people in the geoscience community, we decided to run a, a survey to help us gain a more global prospect on the challenges experienced by people. So in terms of the EDIC survey, this was launched in the summer of 2020 to help us all learn about the experiences of geoscientists. And while this was primarily designed with planning the online conference in mind, we do have a really great resource that we're hoping to share quite soon with people. So overall, we got 708 responses from 58 countries and a majority of the responses were economic geology, but we have a really nice uh, sector dispersion as well. Um, but obviously there's a lot more gaps to fill in around this time today. So. So overall, the EDI data suggested many overarching issues and challenges and really big common themes where if EDI initiatives and workplaces and organizations were effective, um, also the impact of unconscious biases on people and also the experiences around witnessing EDI related issues. And so we do have several summary results videos. So I'm not gonna go into these in detail right now, but you can watch them on our YouTube video as well where the channel is called EDI Conference. So this led to organization and running of our first ever online event, which was the EDA Conference 2020, which had 14 supporting partners who were listed here on the side with their logos, and we had over 700 restaurants. So this was designed in a way that we had three sessions working across two days and a workshop on unconscious bias that was supported by ICRAG and IGI, which we have again this year. And so these sessions really looked at where we've come from, where we are now and where we're going and really started to explore some of the complexity of the challenges in terms of a global perspective. And so there was a lot of really impressive and amazing results that came from that and people sharing their own experiences. Um, and that really helped us to form this year's conference in terms of the ideas and the feedback that we got. So after that event, um, this that first conference in 2020 was initially designed as a standalone conference. So we took some time to decide if we wanted to run and keep going, of which we really did based on the conversations that we had during and around that event. So after the, the conference, we restructured EDIG and we changed our name from uh, the E in EDIG from equality to equity because we thought it better reflected what we were trying to achieve. And so overall, EDIG really just wants to promote awareness of the challenges experienced by geoscientists and promote progressive action to develop a more inclusive, accessible and equitable community. And we have four kind of main streams of focus. So we have events, networks, resources and research. And through those, we've developed things like webinars and workshops and different resource compilations. But it's really important to mention that our current volunteer base is made up of about 30 different people from around the world, from Canada to Australia to Ireland. And so none of this would be possible without all of the incredible volunteers who've given up their own free time to help out. So that brings us to the conference now over the next couple of days. So the second EDA conference is being run to continue the discussion and progress from the first event. And so we really aim to harness the collective power of the geoscience community and to, to enact change and promote um, ways of improving equity, diversity and inclusion in geosciences for everyone. So it, this conference is open to anyone and uh, just really want to bring as many people together in a place and start enacting change for all of us. And so we have three kind of broad teams this year. So data awareness and then also a future focus looking session. So where are we going? And in terms of the structures, we have three sessions over two days, and these have been designed with a global time frame in mind. And so each session will have several presentations, most of which are pre-recorded, and discussions with um, the different speakers. And then also session two has a workshop around unconscious biases and a panel discussion as well. And this is supported by the Institute of Geologists of Ireland and ICRAG as well, so thank you. Um, also, uh, if anyone is looking for the more detailed schedule, these are all available on the Eventbrite online event page. And so if anyone has any issues with that, you can email us as well or just send us a message in the chat. So this is just a highlight of the workshop that's going to be coming up. Um, so there's two panelists, myself and Granny Wolf, along with Yasmin, who is uh, the session or the workshop organizer. So this, is, this uh, infographic is also available on the Eventbrite, so you can look at it uh, there in more detail. 
And again, this is just a really quick overview of the way our sessions are going to go. So again, these have been designed with a global time frame in mind. So um, session two is going to be happening for, well, my time zone this evening at 8 p.m. Um, and that's going to be looking at awareness. And then session two, three is going to be happening tomorrow. And that's going to be like future focused um, session. But we're going to launch with our data driven session as well, which we're going to get to shortly. So just to kind of mention that the EDA conference is supported by multiple different groups and initiative, and not just the conference, but the overall uh, project EDIG. And so many people involved, many different groups have given us their time and ideas. And so we really just want to thank everyone who's helped us to learn and to plan this event. And also to everyone who's helped answer all of our questions and given us resources and other things over the last two years. And we just wanted to mention about some follow-up engagement. Uh, so as I mentioned, all the sessions will be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel after the event. Um, a follow-up email will also be sent through the Eventbrite with links to any resources or any other relevant material, along with a request for feedback. So that will be sent in the week or so after the event. Um, we also have several volunteers writing summary review blogs of each of the sessions, and these will also be shared online after. And then finally, our last kind of engagement way um, is what's known as Padlet. So if anyone has not used Padlet before, it's kind of like um, a sticky board note online where you can have sticky notes and columns on the kind of an online board. So it's just another way to start engaging and capturing people's ideas and thoughts. So this is what it's going to look like when you click in. So thank you, Ellie, who's put an amazing amount of work in preparing this Padlet together. Um, and this is kind of designed so that there's a column of sticky notes for each of the sessions and also one with speakers and also one to collect resources if you would like to add anything that you come across or things that you think are important to share. So just going to finish up and say, just again, thank you to everyone that's in volunteer with EDIG, people who've helped out in different ways and all the different supporting groups and people that really helped EDIG to grow and keep growing over the past two years. And so just after this event, we're going to be taking a bit of a break, but we will be back in 2023. And just a bit of a shout out, if anyone is interested in volunteering, please email us at edig um, at iparkcentre.org and we can talk more about it and give a bit more information. So just to say thank you for attending and please enjoy the EDA Conference 22. Um, and I'm going to hand you over now to session one host. So thanks very much, Elaine, for that introduction. Um, so welcome everybody um, to session one, data-driven change using data to drive equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, so my name is Caroline Tiddy. I'm an associate professor in geosciences at the Future Industries Institute at the University of South Australia. So I'm based down under. Um, for those of you who can't see me um, who, or who are visually impaired, um, I have um, brown curly hair. I'm wearing headphones that have a microphone and I have dark glasses on and I have a maroon colored hoodie. And I'm actually sitting in my kitchen at home, hoping to speak quietly so I don't wake up my kids because it is approaching 9 p.m. here. Um, in Australia, something that we do when we um, when we do conferences or we do public speaking is we acknowledge do an acknowledgement of country, and I would like to do one of those tonight. So, in the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. Here in Southern Australia, I am on the land of the Kaurna people. I pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So the session, as I mentioned before, is um, about data-driven change and using that data to drive equity, diversity and inclusion. So what we're going to do in this session is we're going to explore EDI data in geosciences and we're going to be looking at things such as the methods, the challenges, um, biases and reasons that we actually collect EDI data. Um, sorry about that, that was my laptop reminding me of an update. Um, and um, in that data collection we're going, to, we're going to also focus on how data can be used to take action. So that's where we're going to move into some of the later sessions or the later session within this conference. Um, I also want to thank um, all the organisations who've supported this conference. As Elaine said, they're kind of listed on the side here. Um, the session is being recorded, will be posted onto YouTube. 
Please also remember the edict code of conduct, details of which have been posted in the chat. And of course, remember um, about Padlet, which is a way that we can collect thoughts. Again, uh, details have been posted in the chat. So the way that this session is going to work is that we're going to have four talks and then they're going to be followed by um, question and answer. We'll then have a short half hour break and then we'll have a one hour pack panel session. So I'm going to be chairing the talk session and my colleague Anna Bidgood is going to be moderating the panel session later on um, this evening or this morning, wherever you are. Uh, due to the short time we have um, in the Q&A and then the panel session, we're asking the audience to type all of your questions into the Q&A function in Zoom. This will allow us to easily moderate the questions and make sure we get to those that are being asked um, a lot. Um, so please do use that Q&A function rather than the chat function. Um, and then Anna and I are going to be reading out the questions at the appropriate time. So I'll read, out, read them out during this um, Q&A associated with the talk session and Anna will be doing that for our, um, for our panel session. Um, so it's not me that you're here to, to hear about or to, um, to listen to. Um, so what I would like to do is um, introduce the first of our speakers. And that is um, Gamil Yafay. He is based in Milton Keynes in the UK. One thing you're going to hear is uh, just the, the geographic spread of the speakers in this, um, in this session. So Gamil, he's quite an engaging and passionate person, as you will see. Um, he's a seasoned diversity and inclusion expert, and he is CEO and founder of the award-winning global diversity and inclusion consultancy, which is called Diversity Marketplace. He has worked with numerous companies such as BAE System, Siemens, Rolls-Royce, Eon, Zalando, South Pole, BNB, uh, the NHS in the UK, as well as several charities, schools, colleges, and universities. Um, that's just to name a few of the um, organisations he's worked with. Um, Gamil is a founding member of the MK Ethnic Business Community. He is a trustee for the Parks Trust and Women Leaders UK. He's a member of the Employability Advisory Group for Bath University and has recent, recently taken on a board member position at the Centre for Global Inclusion. So Gamil is also um, the proud recipient of the Global Diversity Leadership Award presented by the Global HRD Congress and the author of a couple of books, Demystifying Diversity and Yemen Proud. So he's quite an accomplished one, um, Gamil is. Um, so his talk that he's going to be giving um, is on data-driven change, using data to drive equity, diversity and inclusion. So thanks, Alin. Hello there. Hi, my name is Camille Yafai and I'm a diversity, equity and inclusion strategist. I have been for the last 22 years, uh, nine and a half years of those setting up um, diversity practices for marketing, branding, recruitment and advertising organisations. And say the rest of the time dedicated to growing my own diversity practice. So I'm both honoured and privileged to be asked to share my knowledge with you today. Um, uh, and my focus for this session, be it, be it a brief session, is data-driven change and how data or how we need to use data in order to drive diversity, equity and inclusion through organisations. So I've seen many changes over my years, but probably the biggest change and what's had the biggest impact has been, you know, a couple, few years ago, three years ago, I think it is, we had um, Brexit, then we had COVID, and then we had Black Lives Matter. Um, as a result of all three of those, we've started to shift our thinking. We've started to move from initiative-itis, um, you know, doing one thing after another and hoping that they're all going to link, uh, link us up. For example, you know, running a reverse mentoring program for senior leaders or doing a bit of unconscious bias uh, training for hiring managers or uh, 
building a relationship with the local mosque and thinking we're going to cover every I think every ethnicity you know those small initiatives uh, will have an impact but they won't have a lasting systemic impact you know when we start to look at the organization holistically when we start to look at everything from you know the involvement of senior leaders right down to supplier diversity and everything in between and we start monitoring measuring and managing our progress on all of those different areas we will genuinely start to see change so let me share um my screens with you so i'm just going to share my slides and again i'm sorry i need to run through these fairly quickly um so i won't talk through all the clients that we work with or have worked with over the last couple of years however what i would like to do is take you through some of our experiences so data collection process and and again before we start to collect data there is so much that we need to do you know i estimate that it takes on average six months to prepare before we've even sent out a survey and in terms of preparation the first thing we need to to work out is why we're doing it why are people going to give us access to all of their personal information so we need to be clear on the why we need to explain how we're going to use that data we need to get every level of management involved in that process talking to so for example senior leaders talking to middle managers middle managers talking to line managers and supervisors and explaining the why and then those line managers and supervisors having meetings with their staff to explain exactly why you know we need to collect this data and data collection window we need to be able to you know have an idea of you know once we've sent out the survey what's starting to happen how are these results filtering through are we getting loads are we getting very little at different times what can we do with leaders to actually say you know we need you to push this more and again what we've done in the past and and again I, I work with some really brilliant people like Toby Milden and what we've done is we've created leadership boards for departmental leads to say okay so from your department we have had x number of and then we make it into a competition but a friendly competition stage three is about analyzing the data and making sure that you know the conclusions that we draw that we're able to put them very simplistically so that everybody understands i say that because i read a report recently from the literacy trust that showed that 79 percent of the working population have a reading age of an 11 year old what does that tell us in terms of how our information is projected onto others stage four is about feeding back so talking to those leaders getting their involvement agreeing on action plans and strategies for making things happen quickly so what data do we need to collect so there's there's three parts to this firstly is that demographic data we need to decide on what data we need to capture whether it's you know length of service whether it's you know ethnicity disability gender when it comes to disability we need to be mindful my experience is if we just ask the question do you have a disability so many people will just say no or not even fill it in or you know do not declare but if you do a list of you know impairments and you do a list of things like learning disabilities such as um uh, let's see autism dyspraxia uh, dyslexia adhd etc and etc and then ask questions around you know do you have physical disability or do you have mental disability etc um people will tick those boxes but they are less likely to tick the disability box 
or do you have a disability box? So once you've decided on the data, then there's two things you can do. One is to gather the, that quantitative um, feedback and using surveys, uh, survey monkey or, or any of the other branded survey tools that you use. But then, then you can ask straightforward questions around how likely, and this is really interesting, how likely are you to recommend this business as an inclusive place to work so you do this as well as the, the you know the demographic data and one of my my favorite questions is are you likely to leave the organization in the next six months and that could tell you so much but also when you start to monitor measure and manage you can start putting you know uh, rois on some of this data or in turn on investments for doing things about them the part three is about um qualitative data and what i normally do when working with data is i take some of the result i look at the results of the quantitative data and i will want to go deeper into some of that data so i'll hold, hold focus groups with different individuals from different diverse backgrounds to get the real a real sense of how they experience the organization and i'll take questions into those uh focus groups and mainly there are around four areas of disability gender race and sexual orientation. However, you can add on more. Once we've got all of this data, we need to have dashboards. And I know this is an American dashboard, but the, the main reason I'm showing you this is it's the first dashboard that I've seen that incorporates non-binary. So you know, the first um, data point is showing the difference in terms of the the makeup of the organization in terms of race and turnover around race and then turnover around disability uh, and gender uh, but you can add in as much information into this as possible as you want to this becomes a live document or a live site that changes constantly so I always ask for data around, I always want to know the data around the last three years of, you know, of recruitment and how many women we've recruited, how many people from ethnic minorities we've recruited, disability, but also at the different levels of leadership. So this dashboard can expand so much. And again, it will give you so much information to hand that you can share with people. So, for example, if you find out, and again, from your your question, your, your question in, in the survey um, that says, you know, are you likely to leave over the next six months? And for example, you have 10% um, of women say they, they're going to leave, then you can use that data to to build a business case for interventions. And this is just an example. So you employ a thousand people, 40% of, uh, of your workplace are women, you know, 400. So 10% of these women are, you know, are seriously thinking of leaving. The average wage, I'm sure the average wage has gone up a, while, uh, a fair bit since then, 32,000 pounds. But if you calculate how much it's going to cost um to recruit those you are or to replace them you're looking in excess of 662 hundred thousand and that's a lot of money you know so things that we need to think about the recruitment costs the you know the unfilled role cost the what it, the time that it takes to fill those roles. And when we've got the data, we can easily explain how to do that. But also there are free tools that you can use, such as the Global Diversity and Inclusion Benchmark. You can use this tool. It is a free tool um, where you you work with a, um, a diversity and inclusion sort of matrix and decide 
where you actually are on that matrix through looking at 15 different areas of your business. So this is a, a free share with you. So go and look it up and it will look at your business from what your senior leaders are doing at that top level right through to supplier diversity within your organization. And when you do that, you can start to apply some of the matrixes to your organization. And this is the, the matrix that, that we use. So, you know, why do we need a dashboard? We need to be able to monitor, measure, and manage. As you all know, you know, what gets measured gets managed. So hopefully, um, you know, once you've done this, you will start to see much more positive visual change that you can use to drive diversity and inclusion and to, you know, to build a business case for new initiatives that you need in order to do so. So thank you very much. My name's Gamil Yafai. Um, you can contact me on any of these sort of um, sites. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much for that um, that video, um, Gamil. So unfortunately, Gamil cannot actually join us for the conference today, but um, we thought it was really important to hear from Gamil, and hence we um, we asked him if he would still provide that video. Um, I'm sure that if you did have any questions that you wanted to ask him, we could definitely direct them um, his way, or as you saw at the end of his video, he was very happy to share all of his contact details. And that was really interesting insights into how to structure a survey and to ensure people will respond so that the most representative data possible will be collected and, and just the effectiveness of using something as, sim as simple as um as a dashboard so it was really really um insightful um just a reminder um so we will go through the talks first and then we'll go into the question and answer um afterwards so the next speaker in this session who i would like to introduce is dr margaret fraser and she is based in washington dc in the usa margaret is director of diversity and inclusion at the american geophysical union or agu as many of you would likely know it as and this sees Margaret work with AGU volunteer leaders and staff to develop and oversee the implementation of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion related programs and events. So Margaret is an experienced educator, geoscience advocate and researcher, and she's held positions as program director with America's National Science Foundation Directorate for Geosciences and as an academic role at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Department of Geosciences prior to joining the AGU. Margaret won a University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Alumni Association Award for Teaching Excellence and the Graduate School Research Award, and has served as Editor-in-Chief and Associate Editor of International Peer-Reviewed Scientific Journals. And Margaret holds a PhD from the University of Southern California. Today, Margaret is going to be speaking to us about AGU's data-driven and evidence-based actions to increase equity and inclusion in earth and space, space science. Thank you for the invitation to present in this session. I would like to talk a little about AGU's data-driven and evidence-based actions to increase equity and inclusion in the earth and space sciences. Some context for the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, AGU is an international nonprofit association supporting an inclusive community of 125,000 and more earth and space scientists and partners dedicated to discovery and to solutions to societal challenges. Our mission is to advance discovery and solution science, to grow the exchange of scientific knowledge, and to promote excellence in scientific research. AGU is a global or organization. AGU members reside in 147 countries around the world and 40% of AGU's members and partners are outside of the United States. AGU has a long history and deep foundation for promoting and supporting ethics and inclusion. 
One of the three strategic goals for AGU is to promote and exemplify an inclusive scientific culture. Diversity and inclusion are recognized and celebrated as being essential for the success of AGU, its members, and the global earth and space science enterprise. AGU has resolved to take eight bold, meaningful actions to combat systemic racism. Our commitments are aimed at systemic change to address racism and foster an inclusive culture. They impact where we invest our money, how we select our leaders, how we share our science, what work we do, honor and reward, and how we foster the next generation of scientists and leaders. The first step to fulfill our mission and commitments is to collect data across programs. This allows AGU to review our progress. It guides our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and strategic goals toward creating a more inclusive scientific community. It provides transparency to everyone on all of our AGU DEI efforts data are collected across key programs and activities and they are linked to the AGU strategic plan and actions for addressing racism. And this data collection focuses outward to the external AG community as inward to AGU staff and our processes and workings inside of AGU. Data collection follows strict guidelines. All information collected is voluntary and self-reported. Confidentiality is paramount. International privacy laws are reviewed and legal and ethical concerns are reviewed. All data are anonymized and combined and available to the public each month. Each year, AGU publishes a report on our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. These reports give a comprehensive look at our new and ongoing initiatives. These are based on data collected over the previous year, and these data are made publicly available. I'll give some examples of initiatives over the next few slides, but some of the efforts included updating AGU publications to help authors and to expand open access, expanding Mentoring 365 and the AGU Bridge Program, revising the name change policy for journal authors, introducing the Indigenous Action Subcommittee, and launching a transdisciplinary journal focused on community science. I show this slide as an example of the data that are available for different programs. In this case, for AGU membership and examples of how the data can be evaluated. For AGU membership, we are able to look at gender diversity, country participation, and career stage trends. For the United States, we are able to look at race and ethnicity. Again, all these data are available publicly, and these data help us determine programs and what groups are underserved. These data revealed that AGU needs to offer better support and engagement to women, people who do not identify as white, European American, or European, members of the LGBTQ plus community, people with disabilities, and those who live and work outside the US. This dashboard shows an example of data collected and evaluated for AGU publications. For our publications, we are able to examine or collect data on first authors, reviewers, and editors. Data collection for people who are not members of AGU, especially those who are co-authors of papers and abstracts, remain challenging and result in incomplete data. 
Despite these challenges, the publications teams have been able to implement several items and programs to promote inclusivity in publications. Here are just some of AGU publications actions toward increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in publishing in 2022. The publications team piloted author pronouns functionality with Wiley. They launched a DEIA or diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility subcommittee for publications. Excitingly, they published a diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility focused special collection that continuously accepts manuscripts. They created a statement of their commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. AGU published its first book in two languages. Publications held bias in peer review training for editors and associate editors. They secured funding for 2023 AGU Journal Editorial Fellowships for early career researchers from low to middle income countries. They published instructions on publishing and open science in multiple languages. And they created new waivers and discounts for publishing fees. Some very important patterns were revealed when data for union medals awards and prize recipients were evaluated. For example, among union medal award and prize recipients who provided gender information, 42% identified as women and 58% identified as men. The majority of scientists, about 64%, re receiving union medals, awards, and prizes in 2021 were based in the United States. And also in 2021, among medal award and prize recipients who provided race and ethnicity information, 96% were white and 4.5% identified as black. These patterns are concerning and the honors team is conducting an audit prompted by these data. The AGU honors program is committed to diversifying and has vowed to expand the pool of nominations, address implicit bias in the process, improve the overall process, and develop data informed objectives. In addition to the audit of the honors program, AGU has created two new union level awards for excellence and impact towards cultivating and exemplifying a diverse and inclusive scientific culture. One award is the AGU Award for Advancing Inclusive Excellence in STEM that recognizes exemplary efforts made by an individual or a team for developing programs, systems, or networks that have led to the advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the earth and space science community. The nominees for this distinguished award will be individuals or teams from all career levels that have proven success in creating and sustaining measurable change within the earth and space sciences community. The other award is the AGU Lifetime Achievement Award for Diversity and Inclusion. And this award will recognize exemplary efforts made throughout a senior scientist career. Nominees for this distinguished award will be individuals who have exemplified success and can inspire others to embrace and drive sustainable change within the earth and space sciences community. These awards will honor those whose work has advanced diversity, equity, and inclusion in science. These awards will also elevate the visibility and the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. These are data that are available for AGU leadership, which includes the board and council. These patterns are causing AGU to reevaluate our processes. 
members of AGU's leadership identified themselves as 83% white and 53% men. 73% of AGU's leadership is between the ages of 40 and 64, while only 10% are under the age of 40. While 25 countries are represented in AGU's leadership, 73% of AGU leaders are based in the United States. In 2021, 6.4% of AGU leadership identified as Asian or Asian American and much lower proportions of people identified as Hispanic or Latinx and Black. Surveys of membership are extremely important and reveal things hidden or not apparent when looking at just data points. You begin to see the data as the people that they represent. This is a survey question that was put forward to AGU membership. Rate your level of agreement or disagreement with the following statements concerning AGU. Three-fourths of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that AGU is advocating for the needs of the Earth and space science community and that AGU is fostering open science and data. This survey question also revealed some nuance. For example, only 61% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that AGU is modeling an inclusive scientific culture. It is also important for AGU to assess demographics internally among staff members. People bring their experiences and their expertise with them and they are reflected in the work that they do. Overall, AGU has a diverse staff across levels, but there are some areas for improvement. About three fourths of AGU staff identify as women and about three fourths of staff leadership, so this is the director level and above, identify as women. About one in five AGU staff leaders, so again, director and above, identify as either black or of Hispanic or Asian descent. But overall, AGU staff identify as 65% white. These data and patterns have allowed us to identify some opportunities and next steps. So we will continue to refine data collection. We will continue to examine any gaps in the data and how to collect them ethically. And we will continue to identify and execute actions toward a more inclusive earth and space science. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic. Thank you very much there, um, Margaret. Um, those new um, DEI awards that have been developed for the AGU from 2023 sound really, really interesting. And um, I think that they'll be a really valuable recognition for those who are working just absolutely tirelessly towards equity, diversity and inclusion within the geoscience community. And I'm going to be really interested to see how they progress. Um, so... So far, we've heard from a speaker in the UK and we've heard from a speaker in um, the USA and we're going to be moving to Australia. But before we do that, um, one thing that, I, that we've, I forgot to do was actually ask our attendees where you are all from. Um, so we would actually really like to be able to collect data on where the attendees at each of our sessions are from. So... If you could, and if you're happy to do so, we would very much appreciate if you could put the country you are currently based into the chat function. And what we're going to do is we're going to then collate this data so we can actually present it visually um, in future and show just um, just how global this, um, this conference um, has been. And whilst you're doing that, so that's in the chat function, if you can put your country that you're based in there. And um, whilst you're doing that, don't forget there's the Q&A function as well. And that's the place that you can put any questions. And at the end of these um, next two talks, we shall be getting to those questions. 
So we're over to Australia. That's where, where um, Shruti and I are. So the next speaker we have is Associate Professor Shruti Sadeshmukh, who's in Adelaide here in South Australia. So Shruti is the Executive Co-Director of the Centre for Enterprise Dynamics in Global Economies at the University of South Australia. Her research revolves around the themes of entrepreneurship, innovation and inclusion and includes the work she's presenting today on challenges for women in male-dominated contexts such as corporate boards, startups and geosciences. Shruti was born and raised in Mumbai in India and after doing an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta in India, she worked in India and later during the dot-com era in IT startups in the USA. She then went on to complete her PhD from, oh, I'm going to get that wrong, Shruti, Rensselaer Polytechnic okay. Institute in the USA. And now she's based here um, at the University of South Australia in Adelaide. And Shruti is going to be talking to us today um, about navigating many barriers, understanding careers of women in geosciences. Thank you very much, Shruti. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Hi, everybody. As Carolyn said, my name is Shruti, and I actually come from the business area. Um, my research revolves around business issues, um, especially around innovation, entrepreneurship, and inclusion. So this project started off as a project of a, a labor of love, um, collaborating with my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanji Perra, and of course, Carolyn, Pro Associate Professor Carolyn Tiri here. Um, you heard from the previous two speakers and they talked about how important EDI is and how one can measure it in different ways through surveys, through by by doing understanding demographic demographics of different organizations. Um, but many times what gets missed out is that uh, EDI is not just about uh, uh, just about recruiting um, young people. And in case of geosciences, what one can find is that there is pretty good gender balance, especially at the college or university stage. But as soon as people start moving into the geoscience careers, that gender balance start dropping as we go along. Let me see if this works. Yes. Um, th so thank you, Carolyn, for this lovely graphic. Um, what we can see is that from the university data, uh, the gap, the gender gap between men and women keeps broadening, keeps widening and widening as people progress in their careers. And the question to ask is, what are the challenges, not just from the entry stage, but through this career, taking a whole career perspective? And for that, um, Carolyn Sanji and I, we use uh, research perspectives from business research, especially focusing on career research, because we wanted to get an idea about the whole career perspective. So what did we do? We wanted to learn the lived experience of uh, geoscientists working in different fields across different careers. So we went and conducted semi-structured hour-long interviews with both men and women geoscientists so working in university, in government, in industry, and they were nicely also divided. We also, uh, we also got them across different career stages so we could really get people's perspective not just at one stage not just at the entry or mid-career or senior career level but a broad spectrum of experiences so what did we find interestingly and this is a big picture uh, i'll go through each of those we found is that there are structural barriers for women in geoscience careers. And they come from the remoteness, the physicality, and the FIFO fly in, fly out culture, um, a, a fly in, fly out organizational systems. But these structural barriers also intermingle with cultural barriers, which are about masculine defaults and gender stereotypes. And they create these behavioral barriers, which are of course the blokey environment, very masculine environment and the unwanted uh, attention. And that can actually lead to uh, a leak 
in the proverbial STEM pipeline or um, or turnover, as one would call it, or employee turnover, as one would call it in business research. But what does that mean? Let's go through some of the examples. And I want to talk through those as we present you some of the quotes, real quotes that we got from our respondents. Let's start with structural barriers. One interesting thing was that we asked our uh, respondents, uh, what attracted you to a career in geosciences? And most of them talked about how much they loved science and how much they loved outdoors. They loved the remote locations. They loved the field work. They loved being out in the middle of nowhere and the fantastic views and so on. So keep that in mind. These are the things that got them into this career. And that was true for both men and women. So, of course, they did not mind the remoteness of the location. They slept on dirt floors. Um, they drove from, uh, they, they camped, they built camps, um, but there were challenges. Not having a toilet was an issue. And any, uh, those of you who have been doing these field works for all through your careers can probably relate to this. Some of these challenges are very gendered, it, especially if you're on a period that can be a huge issue. So yes, that was part of it, but that wasn't the whole. Geoscience careers, especially when they are doing the field work, can be, ex can be highly physical. So essentially, men expected the jobs to be not good or not easy for women. Even at the hiring stage, women had to almost prove themselves that they were physically able to do the jobs, even, even when they were perfectly capable of doing it. That perception of physical, st uh, physical strength and ability seemed to matter, and that if you, were, if you were a small person or if you're a petite person, that itself could be a challenge. And these stereotypes were reinforced, not just during the, not just by the men, but also by women themselves. And that was another findings that we found very interesting is that the stereotypes were not, the gendered stereotypes were not held by just men, but also by some of the women. And then of course that remoteness and isolation came with impact on families. Um, most of our data collection was done here in Australia, and here we have the fly in, the fly out, our FIFO systems, where people work two to three weeks on 12-hour days and then come back for a 10-day uh, break. And that five, FIFO um, systems are extremely problematic if you have family. It's tough on relationships. If you have children, you have to take, it's very difficult to manage that those kind of system. And many times men who manage it, who have kids, they have their partners um, who will take care of the family. Uh, and these are the jobs which are better paying jobs. And so it works out just fine. But at the same time, for women, these become um, an issue. And those are the gendered norms in the society that women are expected to take care of family, take care of children, and that becomes a challenge. So this impact of family responsibilities is borne by both men and women, but women experience it much more strongly than women. So our data also shows that more, most of the women actually experience this impact on family responsibilities. So these structural barriers were part of it, but there were also cultural barriers. Um, and so um, women experienced that they, uh, their identity as a geoscientist was questioned. A geoscientist is usually a man, or male, oftentimes with a beard. Um, and so being told that if your own image does not reconcile with your image of a, a geoscientist, that itself can create a dissonance. You're constantly in a room full of men. You're always the token minority. And then, of course, there is a lack of women in senior roles, which we know not just in geosciences, but many other organizations. But that is even bigger challenge in geosciences. It's not just a glass ceiling. It's a big, thick glass ceiling.
And that means the opportunities you get are different. You can't do certain type of things. Do I have, uh, you're treated as, um, you know, as someone to be protected, a precious little, rather than, rather than a professional geoscientist. And that also means that uh, they are kept away from technical work. You always get peeled, uh, you always get, uh, you, you get assigned works that's consistent with someone else's expectation of gender stereotypes. Oh, women are going to be more team oriented. They're going to be more caring. They are not good at technical stuff. And so you get relegated to projects that are supposedly related to those, um, those stereotypes. And this is something that really bothers me too, is that even in universities, when we should know better, women seem to get a disproportionate amount of administrative tasks rather than getting actual um, technical tasks, which will take them, help them help women advance in their careers. So women have these challenges related to uh, the structural challenges. Then they have these cultural challenges where they have to ba battle the male ideal, the male stereotype, as well as other gender stereotypes. And then comes this really masculinized or blokey environment. And bloke is, um, for those who are sitting in America, bloke is very, very Australian. Um, it just it's just a really uh, way of describing that um, macho boys club um, and that culture. And that meant that many times the socialization, the culture around the place was toxic, negative. Yes, uh, there were um, in, in mind sites, there was porn around the office. Uh, when they asked, when uh, women asked some men to get rid of that porn, um, they were hated. Um, being a younger woman is really hard in a sense that they get most of that unwanted attention, which brings me to my, yeah, which, uh, which brings us to my uh, next point. This is the big picture about how these different barriers work. And the next thing I'm going to show you is that, yes, all these barriers exist. What's the way out of it? So I wanted to distinguish between two levels of strategies. Um, women's strategies or individual strategies. Um, in uh, business literature, when you are uh, explaining multiple levels of analysis, the individual level of analysis is usually descri described at the lower end and the higher or organizational level of analysis is, is uh, usually drawn at um, a higher end. So that's why the women's strategies are below. What are the things that women do to manage these, uh, get around the structural barriers, the cultural barriers, and to change things. And then what do organizations do? So let's start with what do women do? Now, job crafting is a concept from business. Job crafting means that you shape your job to find the most enjoyable elements. And that's generally considered a big positive. But in this case, women crafted the job negatively in a sense that they were undertaking job crafting to survive. What do I mean by that? As soon as they had to, st had to start, um, uh, uh, started to have family, they changed their work pattern. They actually reduced or completely eliminated the field work. And mind you, field work is what got those men and women into this role. That's why they were there. That's what they trained for. And so they stopped going, doing the most enjoyable part of their work um, um, for family reason, creating this really negative type of crafting. Um, on the more positive side, they also built family support structures. And these family support structures included their partners, their parents. Did men do that? Yes, they did but not many of them actually mentioned those family support structures because um, in the, uh, with the current gender norms, with the social norms, the way they are, 
family support structure that includes a partner who takes care of family is is pretty much assumed in the traditional heteronormative family circumstances. To avoid some of these um, cultural challenges, some of the women stopped ident they, they started hiding their femininity. For example, they, uh, one of the examples of that uh, this young woman asked for, uh, for her uniform, asked for a pair of men's pants because she wanted to wear baggy enough pants that would hide her, her body. So they tried to change their, modify their identity or ex uh, modify the expression of their identity um, to do so, which is a really strange and unpleasant thing to do. They also um, adapted their behavior. So when they when they found out that in a particular context, if they're going to get um, unwanted attention, that's something they don't want get into a situation where they're going to be sexually harassed. They modified their behavior. So always bring a safe person with you. Um, the other thing they might do is, well, they got they made their peace and learned that this was a part of being a woman, that these things happen, which is a really horrible way to adapt yourself um, to stop making an issue out of it. But thankfully, these were not the only strategies. Some women, especially the women who were um, potentially older and had a more powerful position, who had a managerial role, had gone through the system, they spoke up, they complained. More outspoken female engineers, managers, they, uh, they use their role, they, they use their power in different ways, in a sense that they actually, not only did they protect the junior women, but they also helped raise concerns. So here they are. What did the organizations do? Organizations actually tried to do two types of strategy. Some strategies actually helped everybody. So for example, redesigned equipment that would help both men and women um, in, from the inclusivity point of view. Some of them also enacted work family policies that were helpful to both women and uh, men, including flex work. They provided uh, better amenities including pump rooms, um, meal fridges, and so on. And some of them provided better quality zero tolerance and safety strategies, safety uh, processes. And then of course, there were other strategies that were more women specific that made their gender salient. So targeted recruitment. Um, they uh, so in Australia uh, there were situations where many uh, some uh, some universities created female only or women only jobs. Some allowed certain geoscientists to actually pick up an office role so that they could continue in their career without having to go into the remote sites. And then some. And some made sure that there were women representations, especially in um, especially in certain roles, especially in leader leadership, powerful role models. But some of these also had unintended consequences, especially this, uh, the organizational strategies that highlighted the femininity that came with backlash and potential stigma. So if someone got told that they were getting a role just because they were, they were trying to balance the male of male female ratios or gender ratios. And then in cases where there was a gendered career track, that meant that some women chose to get themselves out of the technical roles and moved into more office-based roles. And that meant you lose the role model on the side. That means you lose that leadership voice on the side. And that also meant that you don't get women in the profit and loss roles where they have gone through the site experience all through their careers. So what do you do? Where do you go from here? 
the thing to think about is that when you have structural problems, you have to create structural solutions and you have to use the safety lens and enact behavioral change. And there we are. Um, Caroline, you are muted. Well, now that's embarrassing. Um, so thanks very much for that, Shruti. Um, yeah, so because I'll say because I'm very close to the study that you've done, I always find the quotes from those interviews like extremely confronting. Um, and I'll, it'll be really interesting to hear if and how this resonates with others in this audience who are located around the world um, and whether you're sort of, yeah, if these kind of quotes are resonating with you. And we know that you're based around the world because, wow, what an amazing response in the chat about where you're all from. Thank you very much. Um, and it's really interesting to um, to see um, to see where we are based around the world. Um, so our final speaker for this session, who I would like to, to introduce, is Dr. Lucy Roberts. Um, so we're heading back to the UK now, but we're going to Wales this time, and we're going to Cardiff. Um, so Lucy is the Principal Consultant in Resource Geology with SRK Consulting, and she has over 15 years international experience in resource geology, applied geostatistics, and due diligence. Lucy's technical expertise includes extensive knowledge of industry standard geological and mine planning software, as well as specialist geostatistical programs. Lucy coordinates, authors and presents internal and external training courses in mineral resource estimation and reporting. She generates due diligence reports for various international exchanges and for debt funding reviews and has authored and signed off on mineral resource estimates for various precious and base metals, gemstone and bulk commodity projects globally. And that's including places like South America, Africa, Europe, Russia, um, and other places around the world. Uh, so what she's going to be speaking to us about today is women in the mining industry, the role of ANIC data in a changing industry. Thank you, Lucy. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Lucy Roberts, and I'm a principal consultant in resource geology with SRK Consulting based in the UK. And I would like to talk to you today about the role of ANIC data within the changing mining industry. As I mentioned, I'm a resource geologist by profession, but I also am the co-chair of our DNI or Diversity and Inclusion Working Group within our UK office. SRK Consulting provides a wide range of services to the mining industry from the very earliest stages of exploration all the way through to mine closure and covers multiple di technical disciplines, including things like geology, mining engineering, geotechnical aspects, um, tailings, disposal, uh, mineral processing and environmental and social governments, governance. As such, we tend to work as teams uh, who help to, de to deliver projects to our clients. And as such, we consider to be EDI to be one of our key strengths within the company. Uh, for us, when we bring together a, a team of people, we are looking to help to avoid groupthink. You know, we're looking for people who have a diverse background to come together to, de to develop the best solution for our clients. And for us, as a service provider, we think it has a a direct impact on our bottom line, improving our financial performance. Now today, as part of this talk, I'd like to talk to you about ANIC data, which, as it is defined here, is the informational evidence is based on personal experiences or observations rather than systematic research or analysis. And it's often uh, dismissed out of hand as being a slightly unhelpful way of looking at information. But I want to demonstrate today how actually Gathering personal experiences is absolutely key to understanding how we can better provide a working environment for our female staff. As such, I'm going to briefly talk about how the industry is changing, look at some of the statistics that have been gathered recently, have a look at two examples where personal experiences have been gathered as part of a survey, and to have a brief look at what could be happening next in the industry. If you Google women and mining, you will get an awful lot of hits. There is an awful lot of information out there about EDI within the mining industry and that the role that improving the gender balance has improving EDI overall. 
I'm completely aware is that uh, that gender is obviously only one aspect of EDI, but that's what my focus is on this for this talk today. Now, it's very much a hot top topic within our industry, as this conference shows. Now, if you look through the articles and information within the public domain, it's extremely clear that the mining industry is currently in a process of discovery and change. And the first stage of any transformation is a period of self-reflectance. A key drive to that is the data gathered by companies and organisations and how this data is communicated and presented. Within the mining industry, it is clear that there is an appetite for change at all levels. You, know, you will see if you spend any time on LinkedIn, articles being published by companies, by um, commentators about how the industry can be improving and how and what improvements are being made. The mining industry is currently going through a process of change. There are many drivers to that change, but two key aspects come from direct investor pressure and from internal industry bodies such as the ICMM, or the International Council on Mining and Metals. Investors in the mining industry are important in driving a need for improved EDI at all levels. Questions are increasingly being asked by investors about the makeup of management teams and of boards and on how companies are committing to improving workplace EDI. As a service provider, we at SRK are also asked this information when providing proposals or similar to set up projects. Our clients are increasingly expecting an understanding of EDI from their service providers, as well as within their own workforces. Within the industry, mining companies can, be, can apply to become members of the ICMM. As a part of this, members commit to meeting mining principles, as this is a condition of membership. ICMM members currently account for approximately one third of the industry globally and include majors such as Anglo-American, BHP, Glencore, Rio Tinto, etc., plus many others. Mining principles are split into performance expectations and two of these, which fall into the mining principle number three, or human rights, are a commitment to improving workplace diversity, which is number 3.8, and to promote an inclusive workplace, which is number 3.9. The mining principles and performance expectations also tie in with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There is an increased pressure for the private sector, e.g. the mining industry, to support the delivery of the Sustainable Development Goals. Other industry bodies, for example the Gold Council, have also published responsible gold mining principles, and these either partially meet, meet or exceed the ICMM mining principles, and these are directly applicable to all gold mining companies. Organisations such as the International Women in Mining provide important routes for women with the industry to access networking opportunities, spaces for learning and growth, and also a vital support network. Commentators also provide critical insight into the industry. Companies such as McKinsey or Deloitte often publish informative research papers into the role of women within the industry. And all of these aspects all build to help improve EDI in the industry and to promote a culture of change. The AusIMM, which is the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, carries out a survey of, the, of members every year. In 2021, the most recently published report, there are several key drivers to DNI within the mining industry referenced. One of the interesting aspects referenced by the survey was that there was a mismatch between respondents' perceptions of inclusion and diversity within their, within their employers and within the industry as a whole. Respondents to the survey often consider that their own workplaces to be more diverse and inclusive than, a, than the industry. The OSIMM also noted that there was a risk of plateau as a high proportion of respondents reported that DNI in their workplace and industry were staying exactly the same. The OSIMM reported that on site immunities were improving, with less women reporting having to deal with poor facilities. The on site experience was also considered to be improving. However, there was still thought to be room for improvement in aspects such as health services and childcare. The OSIMM survey identified some key challenges, with leadership being considered a top priority for EDI in the mining sector, with workforce flexibility and managerial support also being referenced. The survey also provided some priorities for improvement. These covered aspects such as barriers faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, continuous improvement across the industry, and to address the disparity between perception and DNI between workplaces and the industry. The survey makes it clear that capturing quality feedback is important. 
The survey is conducted annually and built a picture of improvement and change of the industry, although with an Australian focus. The research is an important part of improving EDI in the, in the mining industry within Australia. And one of the key aspects is that of the survey is listening to the everyday experience of women. A recent article by McKinsey, which was published in 2021, indicates that women are often attracted to the mining industry. The industry can provide opportunities for travel, high, new, high remuneration and delivers highly skilled, varied and interesting work. This is, not, this is not only true for geologists, but for other technical disciplines too. In 2021, McKinsey reported that approximately 40% of entry level positions were being filled by female staff. But as time passes, female representation decreases. Women often leave the industry before middle management level roles and cite a variety of reasons for this. In technical and senior manager roles and consultants, resignation of female staff is widespread at this level. The longer women stay in the industry, the more likely they are to remain. As such, mentoring, coaching and development and early stage career women is absolutely vital to, to ensure that we retain our talented staff and to ensure that our female staff are not less lost at this important stage of their career. In March 2022, Rio Tinto published the Report into Workplace Culture at Rio Tinto, otherwise known as the Everyday Respect Report. The report was based on a survey of more than 10,000 of Rio Tinto's multinational workforce through a variety of ways of gathering data. These included 109 group listing sessions across 20 locations worldwide. In addition, 85 confidential sessions and 138 written submissions were also gathered. There was also online surveys, a review of documentation and briefings and meetings. The report provides a compelling picture of how widespread problems were within Rio Tinto's operations. The survey and subsequent report discovered many findings and covered various, which covered various forms of bullying and bad behaviour. Some of these findings are utterly shocking. The report also discussed how there was a strong appetite for change within the company and within the industry as a whole. Rio Tinto absolutely needs to be applauded for completing this review process and for publishing the results. Part of the report also includes a framework for the improvement. This clearly shows a high degree of courage and leadership at Rio Tinto and within the industry. This is Rio Tinto drawing a line in the sand. It's time to make a change. In June 2022, not long after the Rio Tinto report was published, the Western Australian government published the results of an inquiry into sexual harassment at fly-in, fly-out mine sites within Western Australia. Some of the key findings of the inquiry included that women were underrepresented in the, in the mining industry, making up approximately 90% of the total workforce within the state. Interestingly, this figure has remained largely unchanged since 2008. Women are underrepresented across the industry as a whole, but especially in site supervision and management level roles. The inquiry heard anecdotal evidence that this increased the risk of harassment for these few women in these roles, in particular because some people perceived them to be in token positions. The inquiry concluded that merely adding more women to the mix is not enough to counter these cultural problems. Mining companies actively need to improve the gender balance in their workplaces. Part of this must include a greater effort to improve female workforce participation at site, site level supervisor and management aerial positions. The inquiry also made it clear that a key goal was to give a voice to people who had had personal experiences of sexual harassment in the fly and fly industry, as previously these voices had not been heard before. So what is the future of EDI in the mining industry? Everyone agrees that it's good for business. There is an extremely strong business case for improved EDI at all levels of the industry. We know that increased engagement in EDI results in an engaged workforce and happy people work at their best. At SRK as a service provider, we know that we are best serving of our clients when we are happy and engaged. Staff retention of our female staff is also critical. Ensuring early and mid-stage staff can access appropriate mentoring and coaching is key. Also providing ongoing support for women returning to the workforce after raising a family or after maternity leave is also important. Another key aspect is allyship. It can't just be up to women to champion gender diversity. We need men to speak up too. 
we need our male colleagues to ensure that they are not only contributing, but are seen to be contributing to improving EDI within their teams and workforces. As an industry as a whole, we have to continue to listen to the experiences of our female staff. We need to hear women's voices and experiences, and we need to act on the results of that listening exercise. Perception is important. Currently, there are multiple stories of poor treatment of our female staff within industry. Mining needs to rebuild trust with our workforce, with investors and with the general public. The mining industry is currently at an important period of its history. There are both internal and external pressures to improve ETI with regards to gender and the industry needs to be seen to be actively seeking this change. The industry has shown itself to be capable of great change in the past. As such, in my view, it's an exciting period to be working in this industry. The aspects that attract women to the industry in the first place are the aspects that we need to continue to, to champion to ensure retention of female staff. On a personal note, I worked in the industry for almost 20 years and I still love my job as much today as I did when I was a graduate geologist. The industry provides a unique platform to develop your technical skills and to provide boundless capacity for professional and personal growth, as well as for travel and technical challenges. Within the industry, you meet some utterly lovely people. Our industry is in the process of change and the process of rebuilding trust. Both of these things will improve women's experiences and improve greater EDI at all levels. Thank you everybody for listening and hopefully you'll have some questions for me in the Q&A section shortly. Thanks very much again. Thanks very much there, Lucy. Uh, so that was our last talk of this session. So we now have around about half an hour for question and answer. So any questions you have, please um, put them into the Q&A function um, in Zoom and we'll be able to go through and, um, and read them out. Um, so we do have one already in the Q&A function and I shall um, go through reading that out. Um, if all of the speakers want to turn their video on, it means that everybody will be able to see you. Um, so just as a reminder to everybody, we have Shruti and we have Margaret and we have Lucy. By the way, Lucy, thank you very much for that talk. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> um, so if anybody would like to, um, to, to jump in and answer this one, um, then please do. Um, so the question is, how do you close the gap created by best candidate has the most relevant experience and gender ethnic minorities being excluded from opportunities that get them that experience in the first place? Women and minorities often have to work harder or, as it was aptly said, prove themselves in order to gain ground and be considered for certain career opportunities, which in turn slows progress for qualifying for advancements down the line. Is this just a case of education on the hiring side and openness to giving people a chance, or is there a more solid way to move forward? A very long question, but um, would any of you like to tackle that one first? I can have a go. Please okay. do, Shruti. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Alan. And what a good, what a great question. Um, the most important thing to think about in, in this fair is that sometimes you're not comparing apples and apples. Sometimes you have to think about uh, what, the, what the candidates has achieved uh, given the opportunities he or she has received. And I use the word he uh, or they have received. And by that, I mean that anybody who comes from um, a non-default background, someone who comes from a background that's uh, that comes from a minority background, sometimes starts off with a disadvantage. And I'm going to go to some of our other research related to corporate boards and hiring, and I'm going to bring another suggestion. So when you have this kind of a situation, always try to have not just one minority candidate in the um, in your interviewing pool, but actually having multiple candidates. And so once you have that, you have already created um, a different set of benchmarks for evaluating. In other words, when you are interviewing um, a bunch of candidates for a particular position, don't just bring a one token woman or one token minority candidate, bring a couple of more. And that seems to actually improve 
the perceptions, comparability, comparability of candidates and improve the chances of um, uh, of um, non-traditional candidates getting through. So it's a it's it's a different way of approaching this problem. But I hear you. Absolutely, Margaret. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, great question. One um, recommendation and one thing that um, I know has worked for some is um, agreeing as a hiring committee, agreeing on what you need, what you're looking for, and create a, a rubric and have people um, answer the questions that are in the rubric. And that helps eliminate some of the, they're just the best fit, or they're a, a great guy. Um, so if you always have people going back to, well, okay, remember, what is it that we need? What is it that we're looking for? Um, that seems to mitigate some of the bias that comes in. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks there, Margaret and Shruti. Um, I've got another question here that, that is for everybody. Um, and I think he's a right proper corker, actually. Um, a lot of data focused on gender, age, or ethnic background, but diversity is broader than this. Why do you think diversity focuses on these demographics so much? And how do you think we can start being more inclusive in our data collection? Told you it was a corker. <laughs> Can see Margaret's thinking about it, and so should he. Margaret, do you want to go first this time? Sure, absolutely. So, what were the, the um, aspects of that were mentioned at the beginning? Gender, gender, age, or ethnic background? Oh, okay. Um, it is difficult. <laughs> um, I would say that at least from AGU's perspective and our experience, um, even, not even, I will just say race and ethnicity is, is difficult to, um, to collect data on because race is a social construct. Um, it varies around the world. Um, some, uh, in some places it's, rude to even ask the question. So it's just very difficult to be respectful um, coming at it from, you know, a U.S. perspective. Um, other reasons I would say is um, respondents often, and I think rightly so, um, push back on, you know, why are you asking this information? I think that sometimes we're not as good at, at saying, this is why we are collecting these data because we need to know who is part of our community, who we need to serve. And so that, that's one thing that we can do better. We meaning um, people who are trying to collect these data, what are we gonna do with these data? Why are we collecting them? We shouldn't collect just to say, hey, we have data. We should um, collect them with um, uh, something in mind, so. Shorty, were you going to add to that? Sure. Oh, sure, sorry, thanks. Um, thanks. And what a beautiful question. Um, the reason I say is that the three types of diversity you identified, the age, uh, gender, and ethnicity, um, even though they might be hard to measure, they're probably the most visible types of diversity. So visibility makes it in some ways a little bit easier to find them, categorize people, and collect data around them. But then there is also this deep level uh, a deep level kind of diversity that often gets um, unacknowledged. Um, and many times diversity patterns such as disability uh, or uh, are people don't even talk about it because they experience, they, they may um, fear some of the backlash just by disclosing it, or they might be a disadvantage, not just because of the disability, but just by disclosing it. But your question, um, brings me to the point that diversity is not unidimensional. These patterns are not unidimensional. There are multiple layers and layers of diversity. And some people may experience multiple types of 
layers of advantage and disadvantage. We didn't even talk about class diversity, which comes through consistently. So let me take this opportunity to flip the coin and flip the question on its head and say that just as so far we are focused on diversity, maybe a better way to approach is think about inclusion. And that might encompass all these different topics and different types and multiple um, multiple patterns of diversity into one where people don't feel excluded, they feel included. Wonderful, thanks Shruti. Uh, Lucy, did you have something you wanted to add as well? Yes, uh, unfortunately, Shruti basically said what I was going to say, so, oh, <laughs> which is lovely. <laughs> but uh, I was going to say is that as well as you know, you know, the I, I, I suspect one of the reasons why why you know those three areas of diversity are focused on is, as I said, is the visibility. And at that first stage of when you're first setting out on a diversity and inclusion type journey, you start thinking about what's the best thing I want to look at. And those are the first three that jump into your mind. But hopefully whatever you learn whilst looking at you know, those three aspects, you can then take forward into, into other spheres is what I was hoping to say. Mm -hmm. um, stay off mute there, Lucy, because I actually have cool. a, a question here directed mm -hmm. for you. Um, so the need to build or rebuild trust within the mining industry is a very good point. How do you think this can be done? Well, that is a very good question. Um, and I, I think it is a case of we just really need to listen and we need to put in to get, you know, there are big structural problems which have been shown over the last you know, few years of data being published or surveys being published. But I also think that being open and saying this is a problem that we have, uh, we have had in the past, uh, put, and then making sure you actually act on it is the important thing. Not just saying it's a problem. Yeah, we're going to do something about it but actually putting together a framework, for example, how to do something. Now I saw this morning that uh, BHP, Rio to and Fortescue are putting out a, a partnership to actually start addressing some of these structural aspects. So you know, it's up to us as the industry to actually step in and say, this isn't good enough and we're gonna fix it. And we have to be seen to do it. So I think it's you know, rebuilding that trust is going to be a long journey. Obviously it's not going to happen overnight. So I think it's a case of making sure that we are doing something, not just talking about it is the absolutely crucial thing. You know, aspects such as improving on-site facilities, making sure rooms have locks, you know, moving from key entry to, to um, just basic things like card entry in rooms so that people don't have access to rooms, you know, when, when they're not there, that sort of thing, just to make sure that people feel safe whilst they're at work, I think is an absolutely crucial thing. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that, Margaret, from the point of view of a professional society and um, and the whole need to rebuild trust um, in the geosciences? Yes, absolutely. Um, so many of um, the community engage in deep field work. Um, so, you know, either on the ice or on the ocean, um, most definitely. <laughs> I, I mean, nothing to say other than yes um absolutely <laughs> yeah fantastic thank you um so don't forget audience that you we are very very um happy to to ask your questions as well you just need to put them in the q a chat i do have a series of questions here that i'm armed with and i shall ask um continue to ask those but i'm very very happy to to ask yours um yours as well um, a, a question um, that is directed at Margaret, and this is from Anna Bidgood. Um, in Gamil's talk, we heard about difficulties in collecting disability data. How did you collect data regarding disability? And do you think this may have been underreported? Um, this will be a, a short answer. Um, we, we do not collect these data. Um, that's a glaring gap. Um, it's absolutely underreported. Um, and I think it relates to the question um, that was asked previously about, you know, why are the why are there certain aspects that are requested over and over and over again? Um, yeah. Mm. So, is it is that a type of data that AGU is thinking of collecting in future? We are, yes, we are. Yeah. And then um the way we approach it, though, is um, 
what are we going to do with it? You know, rather than just say, here are numbers, what are we going to do with that? Yes, that's a good question. Just saying no. Come on, people, ask your questions. <laughs> You're all around the world. We really want to hear what you think from other parts of the world. So please do um, um, put a few questions in the um, in the in the Q and A. Um, uh, Shruti, um, a question that I've got here for you um, is. Um, where and who do you think change directed at addressing structural barriers should come from? Do you think structural changes that have been made to data have made uh, to date have made a difference? Yes, I think to answer the question, yes, structural changes have made a difference. And I'll give you some very simple example. Um, I grew up in India. And in India, there are mines where women can't even enter. So you come from those kind of uh, those kind of barriers to a place where you start talking about well, there are no amenities, and then you start thinking about well, there are well stocked fridges. So yes, structural changes matter. They make progress, and they make it's. Uh, I wouldn't flip it as a zero one question. I wouldn't call it there is a, uh, there is no progress or there is complete progress. It's a journey and structural changes are making a difference in a sense that we, uh, that we are on the right track, but we have ways to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the first part of that question was, where do you think that change should come from? So I'm assuming that the, the question is referring to, should it come from the organization? Should it come from the people? Where, where should it come from? Because uh, that's a really great point, um, Carolyn. Sorry, I missed that part of the question. Um, because organizations are collectives, changes at the collective level can have a much bigger impact than changing an individual. And so I always think it's better bang for your buck if you can change the collective. And, my, and therefore changes at the organizational level are most impactful and productive. And what do I mean by that change at organizational level? When you create changes at the organization that come from the blessings of the Olympus from the senior management, they are more likely to be implemented. And some of my other research actually shows that having a CEO uh, supporting the diversity and inclusion activities is going to be one of the biggest predictors of how successful they are. So the yes, the changes should come from the organizations and the changes should come from the top, from the very top. Mm. Lucy, do you have an opinion on that one as someone close to the mining industry? Yeah, I know I, I agree. I think change doesn't exactly needs to come from the very top. You know, you we, you know, it's I think that's uh, I mentioned in my talk as well is that, you know, we need we need our male colleagues who are obviously quite frequently in those senior roles to stand up and say this isn't good enough and we need to improve it as well. I think it's actually a, an important aspect of improving uh, of actually driving change in the industry is for senior managers from the very top CEO downwards who you know who may, who are more often male shall we say to actually stand up and say no not good enough that we're going to do better i think it's an important thing yeah um we actually have a question that's coming in the chat here from shawnee lahane i hope i have said your name correctly there shawnee um i'm not sure who this is directed to um it might be shorty because it's about female job crafting um, do you think the difference between the generally male linear career progression and the generally female job crafting pivoting career path is recognised by industry? Mining industry? Um, I don't know. Probably not. In other industries, yes. About 15, 20 years ago, by uh, there was this whole conversation about opting out. And well, this is also showing my age. Uh, but in um, just around 
2004, 2005, 2008, around that time, there was a very beautiful article in the Harvard Business Review by Sylvia and Hewlett, and I can send a citation and the information. Um, and that article, Hewlett talked about um, on ramps and off ramps to careers. And so if there are many times for uh, childbearing reasons, women for as long as they have been in the workforce, they have had to take time off to to bear children and raise family at least or at least have a pay attention to that aspect of their life and that is of course the age where you accumulate most of that's your middle age middle management ages where you accumulate your human capital that would gives you the wherewithal to go advance into your senior careers so if there is an off ramp for these reasons shouldn't there be an on ramp to get back onto that career and if we can create those on ramps for women in those careers, that's the way to make progress happen. And th this is not my word. This has already been written, uh, I don't know, nearly 20 years ago. Wonderful. Thanks, Shruti. Um, I think we have another question here from anonymous attendee. Um, I think this one might be for you, Margaret. Um, so what do you think is the best approach to request data from organizations if you are from an external NGO? Um, I'm, I hope I'm um, interpreting the question correctly, that um, it's another organization asking an organization for data. Um, is that how you read it, Caroline? Yes. Okay. Is. So I so I can speak from AGU's point of view. Um, email us. Um, all of our our data anonymized um, are available publicly. In fact, I could um, drop a link um, somewhere so that you can see our dashboard. Um, so find the if there's a business data intelligence person, um, if there's a DEI officer, um, just reach out to them. Um, if they are collecting data, um, if they're, you know, serious about transparency and making progress, it should be available publicly. So I hope that that touches on um, the answer that you were looking for. Lucy, I think, is someone who's, um, who's collected data and, you know, been involved in data in a different way. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? No, you can read the question again if you like. No, it's okay. Um, no, it's no. I'd be the same. You know, when you know we get asked on occasion for our, um, potential clients to supply diversity data or you know to give an, an indication of you know what our um, programs are within the company, and we have exactly the same thing. You know, we gather data, diversity data and statistics. We have a survey every year. You know, and when asked, those are available. So it's it is just a case of asking I think <laughs> so yeah yeah um, and this one I think can go to any of you um, when filling out data surveys that include disabilities is it useful to report undiagnosed disabilities such as ADHD anxiety chronic pain etc Um, I can go first as I'm still not on mute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I said, well, in that, for example, in our, diver our annual diversity survey within SRK UK, the question we ask is, uh, do you consider yourself to have a disability? So that means it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, as you say, it might include undiagnosed disabilities or it might include something that you consider is actually impacting on the way that you do your work rather than... You know, formally diagnosed, formally accounted for under the Disability Discrimination Act, for example. So that's how we account for it, is that we ask people to self-report, essentially. Yep. So therefore, we consider it to be very useful because we think it's important that we understand the, you know, the barriers that our staff are facing. Margaret or Shruti, did you want to add to that? No. The only thing I might add is that um, disability is often report self report measures are often used in many places, but at the same time, as soon as you start thinking about um, um, legal 
dynamics. It's good to be aware of the laws in your own in the country that you're operating in. So um, we are in a truly global conference with people joining from all over the place. So just um, putting that out there as be cognizant about the laws of that country that you're in. That's a really good point, actually. Um, we've got another question here that is an open question uh, for anybody. Um, to progress with good women balance in top management organization, what will be the best solution? For you, what is the minimum percentage of women that should be imposed in boards, private and public institution, job federation? Interesting question, that one, actually. So I think there's two parts of it. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll ask the first part first. To progress with good women balance in top management of organisations, what would be the best solution to doing that? I'm glad I'm not answering this question, by the way. <laughs> um, well, I can I can answer the first one, <laughs> maybe, from my point of view. Now, one thing that I find extremely important for um, you know, encouraging staff to, you know, to develop their careers is mentoring and coaching. You know, I think that's an absolutely vital part of developing women's careers is to have people that you can go to who you can ask questions on a on an open basis on how to develop your career, how to, you know, simple things like gaining confidence, making your mark, that sort of thing, you know, just improving your self uh, self-confidence having someone you can talk to is absolutely vital. So ensuring that those are, those support networks are in place for female staff will only encourage you know, that talent to stay in the organisation and then hopefully move into those top management roles in the future. But that's, that's very much my experience, I would say. I'll have a sure. go. Yeah, go for it, Shruti. So, um, that was Lucy's answer was so great. I think she absolutely um, she she completely outlined the path from the bottom up, the organic growth into top management, and that's really really fabulous. The only thing I might add to that is just like mentoring and coaching, coaching sponsoring might be another way where you actively support candidates and um, help them um, advance through their careers. But those are all bottom up way of improving gender balance. Um, our research shows that there is also a trickle down effect in a sense that when you have women in the higher echelons of management, uh, it also improves the proportion of women in the uh, level below. Um, and that effect persists not just Im uh, immediately, but a year later, two years later and five years later. So we show that using lagged effects. Um, and we have seen this research in the uh, corporate boards. So one way to think about it is that just like you have a bottom-up strategy, you can also have a top-down strategy where you can have senior role models, which also give the right kind of signals that diversity is valued in this organization. And that's yeah. not just about that's not just about appointing one token woman but having a real gender balance on your corporate boards. So it's not just one woman out of 10. It should be more mm. than that. Not just one and done is not the right attitude for it. So bottom up and trickle down. Yeah. Interesting here. Oh, sorry, Margaret, you go. Oh, okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just add to this as well. Um, so coming at it from a, a U.S. perspective, um, I think, so I agree with the previous speakers. I also think that there should be an, an aspect of trying to change the, the culture of the organization. You know, it shouldn't be on, um, what, you know, women, you know, get better, get all of the training, um, you know, recruiting and hiring. Those practices need to be reevaluated. So often I hear people say, well, we... We put out the call and no one applied. It's like, well, okay, so it's not working. <laughs> so keep trying, try something else. Um, and then also I'll say, um, 
you know, gender is one is one aspect of one's identity. And so, um, you know, maybe we can think broader, as Shruti said earlier, there's there's a multitude of ways people identify. Um, so think beyond just one aspect. So I'll leave it there. Really, really good point, Margaret. Um, and it's interesting. Um, here in Australia, we have a, a like a federal geological survey called Geoscience Australia, and the um, the gender split that they use as a guide is um, 40, 40, 20. So it's 40% male, 40% female, 20% other is um, is essentially what they're looking for. And speaking of um, of other um, forms of diversity, um, Martin Griffin has put some fantastic notes in, in the chat, um, which relates to the previous um, discussion around disability. And he says, always give those with disability the free, the freedom to disclose or not. When you are promoting other people, please do not forget other characteristics, including disability, because we are cut out. And I think they are absolutely fantastic um, comments. Um, there's an anonymous open question has just come in. Uh, if, as general numbers in a career path, you have 70% male and 30% female, how do you manage gender equality? anyone want to take that if as general numbers in a career path you have 70 percent male and 30 percent female how do you manage gender equality Lucy I'll have a go <laughs> <laughs> look but I look, it's, it's going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a consultant answer I'm afraid but look, it's it's very difficult but the only way you can ever I think it was true to you said in her talk is that if you want to demonstrate structural you know if you want to overcome structural barriers you need structural change so therefore it starts at the very earlier stages you know if you've got a situation where you actually have almost parity at a graduate position you know a graduate level uh, recruitment between male and female and 10 years later you don't have that anymore you need to look at what is causing that so it's a case of you need to ensure at the various earliest stages people are encouraged into the industry obviously from a mining point of view but then that they stay so it's it's for me it's 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 not a short term thing. It's not something you can change overnight. It is a case of we need to ensure that from the various early stages of going even going into you know into school age to ensure that women or fem you know, female people are able to access STEM career type work. I think that's an important thing. We need to build it from the very start onwards. It's not a case of that halfway through a career, you can suddenly change that. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Shruti or Margaret, did you want to add to that? No, we might. I've got a, got one more um, question here that I think we will finish off with uh, because we're now at kind of one or two minutes to go. And it's from Martin Griffin. Um, should you promote positive discrimination? I'll take that. <laughs> Go for it, so, um, I think that's a really, really provocative, thought-provoking, interesting question. And here's what I would pitch it as. I would say that rather than thinking about it as positive discrimination, think about it as a diversity conscious activity. So you're not discriminating against someone, but you're taking into account the challenges and some of the advantages that come with different types of diversity. And so some people, so don't think about it as everybody. When, when, so by thinking about as a diversity conscious practices, you are thinking gender conscious, you may be thinking race conscious, you may be thinking double disadvantage conscious. But some of this may also come with different strengths that might be incorporated in your policies. So don't just think about a statistic. Think about consciousness about the nature of uh, the diversity and think about inclusion. Fantastic. Thanks, Shruti. Um, so, and one of the reasons I love that question as well is it feeds very nicely into the next session um, in session two, which is about awareness. But before session two, 
Um, what I would like to do straight away is to thank our speakers for today, um, Shruti, Margaret, Lucy and Gamil. Thank you very much for um, some really thought provoking talks. Um, and it's great because it's generated discussion. So thank you very much. Um, I can't find my little clappy thing. So I'll do this. Clap, clap. <laughs> um, Everybody, if you've got any other thoughts or comments or anything, please don't forget that we have the Padlet um, online um, option as um, some way that you can post those comments and discussions. We'll be collating those so we can use them um, in future. So for now, we've got a half an hour break um, and then we will be returning for a panel session where we will continue this discussion around data-driven change. So thank you very much and I'll see you all in half an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm recording. So. <laughs> and it should be available on YouTube uh, soon after the conference. So if you're not able to attend any of the other sessions, please do check in our YouTube channel. We'll post that in the chat. If you have a question at any point during the panel discussion today, please do put it into the Q&A button. You'll find that button on the bottom of your screens now. And we'll be feeding this in to the um, panelists throughout. We do have a code of conduct and, and in summary, just please be respectful. Um, we have, uh, we'll post a link to, to our code of conduct if you want to have a look at it in more detail, but um, just uh, keep in mind uh, people from a variety of backgrounds and for a variety of experiences and we would like everybody to be able to have a voice. Um, we also have a, a Padlet and now um, this is essentially a sticky sticky notes whiteboard that you can put a uh, virtual one and this has been set up so that you can all add on uh, your thoughts and we can actually capture some of the thoughts from all of you from all different walks of life all different parts of the globe so please do as well as putting things on the Q&A please do contribute to the Padlet because this will be a really valuable resource for us. We're also writing up blogs of each of these uh, conference sessions and this will really help us to kind of capture and capture all the different um, thoughts and ideas that come from these sessions. So the link to the Padlet should be in the chat as well. So I think this is all of the uh, housekeeping. So I'm gonna start by introducing our panelists today. Um, so we have three panelists for our discussion today and they are from all over the globe. We've got Australia, we've got UK and we've got Washington um, as well. So we're right across the globe. And I think we're at the moment time zones include 11.30 uh, at night for Australia. It's half past 12 in the middle of the day for the UK. And, and Jana, what, what time is it for you in Washington? It is uh, 4.30 a.m. 4.30 a.m. So thank you to all our panelists for coming from so many different time zones. So to start with, then I'll, I'll uh, introduce Caroline. You might have seen her this morning as our host of, uh, of the, the talks in session one. Caroline is an associate professor in geoscience and a professorial lead in the Future Industries Institute at the University of South Australia. She's passionate about applied research that fundamentally impacts and advances practices within the geoscience industry and in developing the next generation of young balanced scientists who will have the opportunity to engage in an inclusive workplace of equality and diversity. Now, Caroline's primary research activities are in the Mineral Exploration Cooperative Research Centre. She's the coordinator of this, uh, uh, the education and training program within MINEX, and she's a strong supporter for women in STEM and has an extended research agenda of investigating the enablers and barriers of women reaching senior positions within the academic, government and industry sectors of geoscience. Now, Caroline sits on multiple committees uh, advocating for equity, diversity and inclusion in geosciences and in Australia, the US and the UK. Now, our second panellist is Jana, uh, and Jana is a PhD student in political science at the University of Washington, whose research focuses on international political economy with a focus on the electoral and social impacts of economic policy. Now, Jana is a research, a graduate research assistant at the Centre for uh, Evaluation and Research for STEM Equity, where they work as a member of the evaluation team for the National Science Foundation funded Aspire Alliance. Now they hold an AB in political science from Brown University and an MA in political science from the uh, University of Washington. Now, formerly, Jana was a research administrator at ICRAG in Dublin and an organiser of the 2020 EDIG conference. So welcome back, Jana. It's great to see you here. <laughs> 
Um, and our final panelist for today then is George. Now, George is manages the Geolo Geological Society of London's EDI um, work, EDI work, helping to develop EDI related policies and strategies, running EDI initiatives internally and externally, and all with the aim of achieving a more diverse earth science community. Now, he represents the Joel Sock on a number of external EDI related working groups and committees, and these include uh, the British Science Association's Inclusive Science Engagement Network, the AGU's Inclusion and Representation in Geoscience Task Force, Science Council's Decolonising the Curricular Working Group, uh, and the DNI Progression Framework Steering Group, as well as the AGI Ad Hoc Committee on Harassment in the Geosciences. So a whole range of uh, committees there that, that George is involved in from all over the globe, by the sounds of it, and lots of different aspects of um, diversity and um, equity in geoscience. So we have a range of expertise on our panel today. We have the geographic spread, and we also, our focus today is on data collection, right? We actually have a real range of experiences involving data collection, and that's really what we're gonna touch on today on the, um, the data side. We're also gonna talk about a bit more about data, the analysis, what do we actually do when we have this data? And then leading into the kind of action side, that how do we use this data to, to promote action? And we've already touched on some of this this morning, but today is a real chance to expand on some of these questions. So for those of you who are here this morning as well, any of those questions that you've been sat mulling over while you had your, your coffee in the, in the break, please do type in the chat now and we will, we will get to them as we can. So to start us off, a bit of an icebreaker question here. We're talking about types of data. Everyone on this panel, different experiences in data collection. So I'm going to ask you each to start by giving an example of data collection within the earth sciences that you've been involved with. You know, what type of data did you collect and, and why was it chosen? Now, this is going to be for everyone. So who would like to go first? I'll go first. Go for it, George. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, uh, from the society's point of view, we've kind of only collected EDI-related data from our membership. So that's when people sign up or renew their membership, they're asked to fill out a voluntary form, and it's based, based very, it's similar to the UK census questions. So you just get a broad, you know, general uh, demographic characteristics. And then this year, because and there's no kind of data specialist in house really. We purchased some data. I don't know if that the tech is collecting data. <laughs> but yeah, that was quite wisely. So we collected two sets of data from the Higher Education Statistics Agency, and thankfully they make it all lovely and presentable to you. Obviously, you you have to pay for it, so you know. But yeah, uh, the two sets were on uh, demographics of UK students studying earth science and then the other was kind of demographic demographics of graduates leaving universities in the UK in the earth science with realm of earth science. Yeah. That's the great yeah. stuff. Great, thanks. That's a yeah good overview. So a lot of um uh, kind of weight on the demographic side of data collection, um, particularly um, in terms of those school leavers um, kind of area. Great. Um, Jana, would you like to, to go next? Certainly. Oh, the joys of data collection. Um, <laughs> I have definitely collected um, a, a lot of data, but a lot of it is much different to what earth scientists might collect in their day to day. So I'm a social scientist. I've never been an earth scientist. <laughs> um, I was, uh, it's a happy accident that I'm here at this, <laughs> at EDIC, but, um, I think that definitely the majority of, of what I've done over the, over the years since starting my PhD, and even when I was a research administrator at, at iCRAG and uh, helping to get EDIC started, we were mainly working with survey data. So we were um, usually designing and releasing and fielding our own um, original surveys, usually to, um, you know, we've done so, and we've done so in-house, we did so in iCRAG. We wanted to get a sense of how diverse the center was. We wanted to kind of have a baseline of data. So we, you know, we surveyed 
you know, maybe I don't remember the the number, but probably around 100 or 120 people. And then, you know, we got it out to that we got out and we decided to do a similar thing for the geoscience community at large when we started eating in 2020 and get a kind of a, a sense of people's lived experience in the geosciences. So uh, and the earth sciences, and atmospheric sciences more broadly. So we um, did a, a survey with uh, an N of around, I think maybe 600, 700. So those kinds of questions have included qualitative and qualitative things, you know, rate on a scale, how much you agree that there's diversity issues in the geosciences, that there's, um, that you've had difficulties in your work experience because of your identity. Um, and, you know, or select a category from a drop down. Where do you work? Is it in academia and in industry and in government? Um, but we've also asked people more qualitative questions too, you know, write in this text box about your experiences. Tell us um, the specific barriers, struggles, challenges you've faced. And then on the flip side of that, we have different approaches to analyzing whether that data is um, something that we can kind of extract things from in almost like a focus group kind of way, or whether we need to do more rigorous kind of text analysis on, on that kind of data. So. Short answer is it's it's mostly it's mostly been survey data, but a mixture of qualitative and quantitative, much like it, and it sounds like uh, it's similar to what George is working with too. Great, yeah. So you touched upon so many different aspects there, and we'll sure we'll come back to you with more specific questions then about all these different types of data and how you decide how you're going to collect or how you're going to ask certain questions, and actually how you're going to how you can analyze them as well. well um, I think we'll probably will come back to you at a later point to ask you a bit more about that methodology and that workflow, how you work through that data and the kinds of questions you want to answer. Um, and actually that brings us on to Caroline because Caroline, you, you have experience with, with, with survey data as well, but with also with another, another type of data that we maybe haven't touched upon too much um, in this discussion so far. Yeah, so um, the survey data in the study that, um, that I've been involved in, which um, if you were in the talk session, you would have heard um, from Shruti about um, a little bit about that um, that data, no, that that study that we did. Um, so along with collecting data from um, CVs and demographic data, our main form of data collection was actually through um, interviews. Um, so one-on-one -on -one interviews that we did with people. So we were doing a project um, looking at trying to understand the enablers and barriers of women to reach leadership levels within the geosciences in academia, government and industry. So we, we approached that by um, doing in-depth interviews that would actually go into, um, would ask people a lot about their career, their whole career. And so we interviewed a range of Australian men and women geoscientists um, from junior through senior career stages from, from industry, government, academia, and from a range of organisations in terms of type and size. And we asked them about different stages of their career. We asked them about metaphor, um, about um, mentoring, and if they were at a senior stage about um, being a mentee. We asked them about perceptions of career. So by, even though the, the interviews took a lot of time, by conduct by collecting our data through interviews, we were able to get the, the data we collected was had a lot more depth to it than what we could have collected if we did that kind of um, data collection process using, say, a survey or or a questionnaire or, or something like that. We did collect a small amount of data using a questionnaire, um, but it was very, very targeted to one aspect of the project that we were looking at. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's really weird because as a geoscientist, um, instead of having to deal with numbers, it had to, as your data, had to deal with words as data. So um, Shruti and our other, other colleague, Sanji, um, they had quite a lot of fun teaching me about qualitative data analysis and <laughs> using words as data, um, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, very different type of, of data analysis, I think. And um, we can we can talk more about that, about how we actually approach these different types of data. I'm actually going to start with data collection. And then my vague plan here is to move on to kind of a bit more in the, the analysis and then um, also into the, you know, how does that feed into to action? So in terms of the data collection, and we've talked about this um, more quantitative data, actually being able to collect data from a, a drop down menu. And this might be useful for, for maybe for some of the, the demographic data maybe, but um, 
we've already talked in the earlier session about the different types of diversity. And I guess my question, um, which might be good to start, start with you, Caroline, on this one, um, is how do you collect data on inclusion? Because that is inherently more qualitative. Mm. It is because if you want to, I mean, if you look at the definition of inclusion, it's it's that um, a person will feel as though they have a sense of belonging. They'll feel as though they, they're they achieving. They'll feel as though they can bring their whole self to work. And you can ask somebody that in a slide bar type question. I Obviously, you know, I'm up with the lingo on those kind of questions and what they're called. But, you know, you can rate, you know, from one to five. Do you feel as though you um, you um, belong to your workplace? But you don't get as much of a sense out of it. So I think um, in terms of collecting data on inclusion, because it is such a personal thing as well, um, that's where I think the strength of collecting data through interviews comes into its own when you are trying to answer questions like inclusion. Do you do you feel as though you you belong in your in your workplace? Um, but that's not to say that collecting um, other data using your, your classic kind of your drop down menu, your multiple choice is is invalid. That's that's not the point at all. But um, but I think that the, when it came to collecting data around inclusion um, in the study that we did, we were we were really um, surprised with the different directions that 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 kind of data went when we did look at that topic of inclusion because um, people were answering the question of is geosciences an inclusive career without realising it because of just by telling the narrative around their career and some of the stories that came out um, were extremely powerful and they were really confronting um, and we couldn't have gotten that through just asking somebody to fill out even some free text because it took a while to actually draw out all of that detail and we could do that without people realising what we were doing. So that's where I think that um, that kind of that qualitative interview data that we collected is, it just comes into its own in those kind of questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks for that, Caroline. And I think a lot of the data we collect, we don't, we don't always have that interview data it sounds like that that could be something that is important to include when you're designing these types of, uh, of, of surveys you know what is it you're trying to achieve with this data but maybe in a moment we'll come to you Jana and just to see where your experiences come with the kind of more on the, the survey side and, and how you approach that um uh, but before before you answer, Jana, um, just to remind us to everybody that um, if you have any questions or even comments or, or your own experiences in this as well, please do uh, put this in the in the Q and A, um, and I'll and I'll try and um, bring this into the discussion as well. But uh, yeah, Jana, do you have any thoughts on this? Sure, certainly. So. Um... Definitely think that one one of the things that kind of came to mind in, in light of in, in light of some of Caroline's comments in particular was how important it is when you're collecting data generally to have the whole process in mind. So you need to be kind of thinking, you know, you need to have your objectives, your wider objectives. Why am I collecting this data? What are the broad categories of things I want to know about? But also you need to have even at that early stage when you're deliberating whether you're going to do a survey, focus groups, interviews, whether you're going to go out and, you know, whether you're going to go and collect existing census data, go and collect panel data and, you know, large ed household studies, whatever it is, and, and, and run more quantitative analysis. You need to have the analysis in mind early. You need to kind of be, you know, if you're going in a survey or a quantitative route, you need to kind of be thinking about your, thinking about your statistical tests, it's way too early to say that, <laughs> say those words. Um, but, you know, and also you need to be thinking about the kind of 
you know, if you're doing focus groups and interviews and surveys, you need to be thinking about your coding, you know, the content analysis that you're going to be doing. And whether it's going to be, you know, relational, am I going to be taking things from the texts, you know, the transcripts, and am I going to be trying to kind of find relationships between the data? Or am I going to be simply looking at the data and pulling out pulling out concepts, identifying, um, identifying keywords, categories, emotions, uh, you know, other, other kind of things like that. So I would, uh, the first thing kind of, I would say that, that, that comes in mind as, you know, if you're going to be a, a practitioner in collecting data in any ways to kind of be thinking about your analysis. So simply so that you can kind of go back to the start and, and always kind of like make sure that what your, your methodology is kind of matching your objectives. Cause you know, I think Caroline's point about the strengths of, of interviews and the strengths of, um, um, of you know, focus groups are another great way to do do things because you can have pe participants in a room, even a Zoom room, virtual room, feeding off of each other and 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 relating each other's experiences. And I think that that is also a very very um, kind of strong methodology in, in the kind of broader diversity and inclusion space, especially when we're talking about lived experiences and the fact that so often, <laughs> so often you know, challenges, barriers are often things that we think about more subconsciously and unconsciously and having focus groups, semi-structured interviews, things like that can help really bring, bring things to the light. There's one other thing I'd say more specifically about surveys, and that would be one thing that I always, you know, I've learned you know, the hard way over the over the last few years of, of doing surveys, and I've, I've learned this in my current job working with the Aspire Alliance, is to, to be very, very careful to only collect the data that you need, especially when you're going to be working with, with marginalized groups. I think it's very important not to be what some might call a data vulture, not to ask questions you don't need the answers to, not to ask, not to bombard people with 40 survey questions and a survey that takes close to an hour to fill out, not to bombard people with interviews that take north of 90 minutes, things like that. People's time is precious and people's labor is precious. And you need to resource your efforts appropriately. You need to bear in mind, you know, the amount of participants you're going to have. Yeah, workshops are great. That's popping up in the chat. That's also fantastic. But, you know, if you're going to be working with a lot, if you want to get opinions from several hundred people, people's several hundred people you know interviews and workshops and focus groups might not do it if you want to go out there and, and find out the data on every geoscientist in the world chances are you're going to need to run an online survey or poll of some kind and you're going to be looking at something more quantitative so i would definitely bear in mind the kind of burden of doing this research on the participant you don't want to be too extractive about what you're doing as well so especially when you're going to be raising things that are sensitive for people things that are, you know, difficult for people to write about, difficult for people to speak about, difficult uh, for people to bring up um, into their day-to-day -day lives, you want to be very cautious about that. So I'm not saying the answer is always to pare down the amount of data collection you're doing. Rather, I'm saying be, you know, be careful, try and do a pilot study. If you're going to do a survey, take a small end, um, you know, maybe 20 people, send it to those people first and figure out whether or not, you know, what you have is sufficient, whether you need to add more or, or pare down. But the, at the end of the day, you don't want to be, to be burdening people with, 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 uh, with too much. And also extracting data you're not going to use. So, you know, kind of reduce your own workload too, by just being, being cognizant of what you're really going to use and, and visualize your end product too. Think about the report whether it's an evaluation-based report or a research manuscript that you're going to be submitting, think about that end product too and what's realistically going to, going to end up in there as well. It sounds like planning is a really important part of this. You know, why are you collecting the data? What's the best way to, to capture the, um, the different points of view that you're trying to, to, to capture and what form is, should, should you be collecting that data? And in fact, we have a comment here um, about um, unconscious bias because unconscious bias is something that come up time and time again. Um, and the difficulty here can be people not being aware of what their own unconscious biases are. So in data collection and survey implementation, how can we start addressing unconscious bias at the design stage? So for example, um, we alphabetically list answers to put a question rather than random because 
um, you'll often put what you're familiar with first on those uh, on those lists. Um, I don't know if this is something that any of you have had to think about when you've been designing designing surveys. Anyone want to comment on that one? <laughs> it's hard I to don't... be aware of your own unconscious biases. I know I'm starting thinking about oh, what am I, you know. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I try and just go with alphabetical if if I can. I think it's the a, a safe bet. Yeah, I would agree with that alphabetical is good. Reverse alphabetical is also it's also good. It kind of it, you know something something arbitrary, but um, I think it's really 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 difficult. And I think it's it, I think that's the reason you had a bit of hesitation from all three of us to answer this is because none of us have a silver bullet for you know addressing unconscious biases in in a survey. But this is where I think the kind of the role of of, of doing things like you know either a short kind of preparatory focus group or 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 a, or a or a pilot study of a small number of participants could be can be very helpful there and you can ask for critical feedback um and, and you know positionality matters make sure that you know it's it's not just people who look like you <laughs> sound like you and have the exact same pronouns as you designing the survey to get input from from a diverse array of of people because this isn't you know just as you know it's not as simple as just kind of typing up a quick questionnaire and sending it out you need to be very deliberate about collecting this kind of data you know it's not something that um it is is something you know it's it's something that comes with consequences and it's something that you know takes a significant amount of, of labor and having having input from diverse perspectives will help you mm -hmm. um with that broadly and actually on that note it, you know there are resources out there which where people have, have have written uh thoughts and and top tips really on on survey design and actually um if anybody knows of any of these good resources please do post them on the padlet because we're always looking for to sh be able to share more of these resources so um, please do share them with us as well um, now this kind of links a bit to a comment then from um, uh, from Martin who who says that you know online surveys a, a good response rate is around 25 to 30 percent but you know more data is surely better but also the the kind of 70 75 percent people who don't reply are, are important so kind of thinking of those questions of why are they not replying um and how do we kind of encourage more people to reply without you know burdening the participant as well um so thanks for the for the comment martin um and actually when we're designing these top these surveys this is something that edig came across as i'm sure you're, you're aware jana, jana as well like uh, the first time around was the, the questions about intersectionality it's so easy to have a drop down list but um what if people fit into more than one box or that those different boxes actually interact in, in, in different ways. Um, so do we are we imposing limits on responses by having these kind of box options and how might we go about avoiding that in our in our survey design? Again, open question, so I'm not targeting anybody here. <laughs> I'm going to ask is that specifically for me, but I'll, I'll let one of my co-panelists field it first. If you have a, an answer to hand, please go ahead. <laughs> um, what we did with the the uh, survey that goes to the members is, let's say if we're trying to get some information on disability, we don't limit it to one column. You can go into a second, third, fourth if, if you need to. So it's given people the ability to, to answer or tick as many as they feel like they need to tick. So, that's how we do it, if that's helpful. Jana, do you have any, any additions? I do, I agree with George. I think it's a very important point. I think we learned this in the first iteration of the EDIG survey and I've learned it in my evaluation work um, more recently too. If people fit into more than one box, you need to let them, <laughs> you need to let them. Um, you, you know, and Xbox options also matter a lot. So, you know, make sure whatever survey software you're using, whether it's um, you know Google Survey Monkey, Qualtrics is is what I use a lot these days, um, but that you know, obviously requires a subscription. But use what you have, you know, use what you have at your disposal. 
Um, you need to always buy fancy subscriptions for everything. Um, you know, try try and use something that allows you to field um, multiple selections in one question and allows something that allows uh, and and allows you to type in um, options too. Because even trying to, you know, we were trying to design the edict survey and trying to think of, you know, universal um, or at least internationally recognizable categories for race and ethnicity, for example. So we, you know, we had people click their nationalities from and citizenships from a, from a drop down but we also realized that Ireland we have a really really weird category of you know <laughs> racial uh, and ethnic um selections that you can pick you can like white Irish black Irish other <laughs> it was ridiculous and then but in the US you know it's very targeted around around you know the American experience and we were like oh shoot what do we do like we have to figure out how to make something that people from the geoscience community all over the world will be able to tick this box and fill it out and make it recognizable this is a big challenge and I've encountered that recently as well with um with designing questions around around gender uh diversity so you know a lot of the times and I think with the racial diversity thing I think a lot of the times you know you're operating surveys in a in in, in a context within one country so you can pick your your census whatever your country's census uses. And often that will that will work okay. It will not always be appropriate because you know in the US we, we have one box for like American Indian and Alaska native, which is fantastic. You should absolutely have a box for, for indigenous people. But if you're doing that survey in Australia, it's not going to be called that. If you're doing that survey in Norway, it's not going to be called that. So you will need to you know use appropriate language to delineate things if you're doing an international survey. And that's not something I have a, I don't think, I don't think I have the absolute best practices for that nailed down. But I, um, I, I've definitely also encountered this with regard to gender diversity too. So I, I was, I came onto a project and I was working on a survey that had the options and it was pick one uh, of these gender options, man, woman, or transgender, which was insulting and bizarre. And uh, I, didn't appreciate that at all so I you know I, I went to the supervisor that I was working with and I was like you cannot just ask people if they are a man a woman or a transgender and you cannot treat it like it is a separate category and then the next iteration of the survey I saw was man woman trans man trans woman and I was putting my head in my hands kind of going ah oh, here again same problem <laughs> so you know I, I I did I did I did my best to kind of look at the literature and realize, okay, first of all, you need to allow people to tick more than one. Second of all, you cannot come along saying that a transgender man is somehow different from a transgender woman. You know, in my view, the, the, appropriate, the appropriate way to ask people a series of gender options, let them choose more than one, please let them choose more than one, and then ask a separate question if they identify as transgender. That can be kind of a two-stage approach to doing it that way. So, you know, a, Again, you know that there is tremendous value to kind of workshopping these ideas to the to the best extent that that you can. And I think when it comes to intersectionality, it, it really pays to be very cautious with your language um, and I'd allow and, and be as flexible as you can in in, in the in, in the categories of like question design as well. Yeah, thanks for that, that answer and all the examples as well. It kind of links back to what you're saying as well about potential for pilot um, studies if you're launching a survey that's maybe a bit more global. Um, and actually, this is a great way to kind of reach out to test your own network as well, because because you often want to uh, collect responses that may often, you know, they often reflect the networks of the people that are sharing it. So when collecting the data, you know, we're creating these biases in our data collection as well. Um, and it might make some issues seem less significant as well. So how, how might we overcome bias data collection uh, and ensure better representation? Should, we're kind of going a bit more into the data analysis here as well. You know, should we look at um, kind of normalizing the data and how does this help us to, to get around some of these biases? And I don't know if, um, again, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna target anyone particularly, but if you have an experience of, of dealing with these um, kinds of biases in your data, please do um, share them with us. Uh, yeah, I could certainly comment on that. And, um, and I think it kind of speaks to Martin's comment around then there being sort of that 70 to 75% of non-replies is that, um, it is a real challenge that we actually 
bring conscious bias and we in into our data collection and we certainly found this within the um the interview study that we did is that we very easily were able to get people who were aware and were advocates for gender diversity, increasing gender diversity in geosciences to actually engage with our interview process. It's really difficult to get people to engage with such a process when they have no interest in it at all. So our data was naturally biased. Um, and we didn't figure out a way, it was a pilot study, um, so we didn't have endless resources, we didn't have a lot of time to dedicate to it, but um, we didn't actually work out a way to get around that bias and we, we've actually had to acknowledge that in any kind of publication that we put forward is that, you know, all of the people who participated in the study were, they had a bias towards being advocates for gender diversity in geoscience. So if anyone has a solution to that, love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Carla. I think that's always a challenge, isn't it? Trying to to really you want to expand that side that network. You want to you want to um, get different voices, mm -hmm. but you also don't want to just get you know one voice, uh, even if you're trying to kind of address yeah. certain questions. Um, and those people fall into that seventy to seventy five percent of non replies. So yes, Martin, in reply to your comment, I think that data is really important but it's the hardest data to collect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So maybe let, let's um, think about applying this to, to some of the, the data that maybe you, you've been collecting, George, um, in terms of as a professional design society, you know, how is that data related to the geoscience community, but also the community beyond the society itself? You know, JOLSOC is one of uh, is a very large society with a lot of members but are you are you seeing a lot of response like a large response rate um in your kind of survey collection and and how do you think that is like represents the geoscience community which is i guess one of the big questions that you're answering right <laughs> yeah it's a difficult one i mean for i think the response rate for the um, membership survey that we have we got I think last time I looked, it was 2,200 out of 12,500. So that's just the, the members of, of the society. So it, uh, you can't even really say that it's reflective of the geoscience community in the UK. So it's difficult. Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, yeah, a difficult one, especially because, like you say, twenty two hundred. To me, my first thought is, oh, that that's that's really good for a survey. Twenty two hundred. Um, yeah, and it's probably a decent reflection of the society, but like, but not the wider geoscience community. In the UK, if if you keep on being finicky about it, if that makes any makes sense. But um, I mean, there's there are ways that you can try and uh, fix it by weighting the answers differently. And depending on who uh, responds to it, but I mean, I, I'm not a data scientist, so I can't really talk any further on it. I have talked to people about that. If you have that issue, yeah. but beyond me uttering that one sentence, I can't go any further on it. But yeah, it is an interesting topic. Leads me nicely into my next question. Thank you, Josh. Um, <laughs> Thinking about these data, then we, we can collect it. Uh, we might have one question uh, which could have a link to another question. But how do we and do we go, go about looking at that data? Do we have generally a 1D approach? And I think I'm going to come to Jana first here from your experience with, with dealing with, with these kind of, uh, of, of data. And maybe you could talk us through a bit about how you would approach these multi dimensional issues. Can you reiterate the question there, Anna? I didn't know what you didn't all come yeah. through. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I was we were just talking about uh, the different um, when you different types of uh, questions, different types of data that you might collect, but they're all um, linked to each other. So this intersectionality question again, but from a, uh, a data analysis perspective, you know, we might have um, questions um, with with one answer, but we want to. 
we want to actually look at them with a view to the other answers within the survey. So thinking about how do we link these answers together or how do we normalize it to, to a wider community or within the data set itself. But how, how can you talk us through the methodology that you might go through, the thought process that you would have when dealing with these kinds of questions? Sure. So I think like you would approach this with, you know, your own questions about kind of like, you know, whether you use more inductive or deductive analysis here, but you can kind of think about why you think certain questions might be related, why you think that certain, um, you know, you can splice your data and look at the demographics within a specific answer. Um, so you can kind of, you know, if you have a question about, do you agree that there are barriers to entry in geoscience based on identity, do a simple Likert scale, um, and you can kind of splice that by saying, okay, so I'm going to look at the overall population of my 2200, of my 600, however many respondents I have, and you can kind of come um, come across and say, well, generally the population says this. Now let's go in and let's say how many white people are saying this, how many women are saying this, how many black people are saying this, you know, how many transgender people are saying this. So we can kind of like splice things by looking at things demographically. We can also kind of, um, you know, you can run more statistical analyses, you can run regressions to relate questions to one another if you want to do that. But I think oftentimes you don't need to get that technical with, unless you're doing a very large kind of um, data sample, you can do a simple significance test. You can kind of just make sure that, you know, you have a, a sample size large enough to run a, a simple statistical t-test, you can do that. But, you know, if you want to if you want to go about uh, publishing this in, you know, a very, in like a research journal, you know, you, you can go ahead and run a, <laughs> run a regression, you can run panel data, you can run a, a hierarchical linear model, but that, that requires, you know, I don't think that's necessarily always, always necessary for, <laughs> um, for this kind, for this kind of work. You know, if you're doing, if you're trying to evaluate the impact of something, if you're trying to to get kind of just a general sense, you're going to be looking at more descriptive statistics, to be quite honest. You're going to be getting kind of just a general sense of, you're, you're getting a pulse for the population. And you can, um, yeah, people are people are coming in, people are talking about Excel data analysis. You don't, yeah, you don't need to use R data SPSS all the time. I think Excel is a really powerful tool. The first thing I'd say is use what you have. <laughs> It'll be the very you know, if you don't know how to code in R, if you don't know how to code in, in, in any of these other things, perfectly great. Use what you have is the very first thing I'd say, whether it's the, you know, the Google Forms auto pie chart thing that pops up or, or whether you want to use Excel, Google Sheets. Um, that, that is definitely an important thing to do. You can use, yeah, there's, but I think a lot of it is I think the biggest challenge, and I think this is one that one of early uh, Caroline's earlier comments addressed, is is a sampling um, issue. And I think you know, it, it, especially doing EDI work, it's so easy to undersample and oversample. I think when we're looking within specific populations, if we're looking at advocates, if we're looking at the kind of people who would click the edict link survey, we might be looking at oversampling marginalized populations. But at the same time. It's a thing we do. We will we oversample marginalized populations sometimes in that work. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, <laughs> especially when they're underrepresented voices. Oversampling them, yeah, maybe it's not the most scientific approach. But I don't think everything has to be has to be scientifically statistically perfect. That's kind of not the nature of of, of the work we're doing. So kind of keeping that ethos in mind is is important, and and you know giving oneself giving oneself a break and and you know there there will always be a statistician in a in a tweed jacket with leather with leather patch elbows who will come along and say well that's not significant but i don't necessarily think that that's it's the end of of the world and i think um you know, if you're looking at things from a qualitative point of view, that's where that's where we get tricky. And that's where we try and find themes in text and we try and relate different answers to each other. But you can still splice data and look at kind of strata within that. You can you can take a, a set of responses, a set of responses for people with certain identities, for respondents who picked certain things, uh, certain responses in, in a question, and you can you can splice and you can analyze in more detail too. I don't know how, how helpful that was, if it was too nebulous, but you can feel free to ask follow-up questions.
Yeah, I think, thanks so much for that, Jan. I mean, what I kind of get from this as well is that this comes right back to that planning stage. What do you, what questions are you trying to answer? And a lot of those you can ask before you even get the data and think, figure out, you know, what kind of um, statistics do you want to do? It doesn't have to be a big kind of, you know, scary statistical study. There are simple ways to approach this. And we actually have another comment from Martin here who says, you know, we can compare surveys uh, data to like national averages uh, protected characteristics as well. So an example would be uh, you compare it to um, say 9% uh, of, of disa disabled or 14% in society at large um, within like your, your survey compared to national averages. And that's something that uh, I think we've, we've tried to do with the, the uh, EDIG survey as well. Um, but maybe come, come to, to you, Caroline, just for a bit of a follow up question there, you know, we talk, um, we've talked about the, the qualitative a bit more now, uh, and we just touched there at the end on the, the more interview type data, you know, how do you go about picking apart all of that vast amounts of information uh, in those interviews that you conducted? Yeah, that's a, it's, it was quite a learning experience to to see how it's done. Keeping in mind, I've only done it once. So there's potential that Shruti will, and feel free to do this, Shruti, is, um, is correct anything that I say about what we did. Um, but we basically, um, we read through some of the interviews. Keeping in mind, these were one to one and a half hour interviews. So some of these interviews, once they were transcribed, went for 20, 25 pages of text. Um, so going through those and picking out common themes that we identified within the answers to the questions, because each survey was done with a standard interview protocol. So every every in, so each interview was done with a standard protocol. So the same questions were asked with the same wording in each of those interviews, which is really important to make sure that there's continuance and compare you can, and you can compare your interviews. And so we, we had to go through, um, let's say, the first 15 out of the 70-odd interviews that we did and identify a series of themes um, that we could then code. And so, for example, we had themes around um, what Shruti was talking about in her talk earlier today, um, around structural barriers, around cultural barriers, behavioural barriers, and then you can subdivide those themes as well. So when it came to the behavioural barriers, you know, what was the woman's response to a behavioural barrier? When it came to structural barriers, what was an organisational response? What was an employee's response? And so you can sort of subdivide each of these broader themes. Then it's a case of um, pulling together a story out of that um, and, and a narrative out of that, um, out of those themes and out of what you identify out of the data. The downside to it, I think, is it takes a lot of time. You can't just, you know, with, with your with your drop down menus, with your scale bars, you know, your surveys, you can just say, oh, I want to see, you know, how many women versus how many men. I want to see how people rate their sense of achievement. Um, you know, so I'll just do a quick graph. It's it takes a lot longer than that. And so that's the real downside to this um, type of data collection and, and that needing to do that style of analysis. There is software out there that helps you do it. Um, but of course, once you actually get into it, then you can you can pull a lot more out of the data because it's really rich, but it just takes a lot of time. So it's, yeah, it's all about coding. Um, yeah, which is quite an experience as a geoscientist. <laughs> it definitely sounds time consuming to say the least yes. but actually um uh, there's a suggestion here also from martin in the chat that actually something like a word word cloud might be a really good way to um to start off um and for those of you not familiar with word clouds the, the, the more times a word is mentioned the bigger it will will plot on a on, on, on the screen and actually that i think is quite a very powerful way of of, of communicating data, but actually from the analysis perspective as well, is that is that something that um, that that's uh, very useful? Um, I mean, these are open questions that feel like you have to answer these. It's from my limited experience with <laughs> survey data. But um, just just moving on, I'm conscious we're kind of again coming towards the end of the, the panel, really. So please do keep your your questions coming. We do have time for uh, for a few more. But just thinking about 
what we, what we do with this data then we've, we've talked about data collection we've talked about some of the analysis side of things as well um and we've talked about how it's really important to know why you're collecting the data that you're collecting but what else can we do with this data you know we, we, there must be so many um disparate surveys out there and and is this data shareable is it is it not shareable because of, of data protection you know and and is there are you aware of any anywhere that actually like um pulls together or organizations or initiatives that actually pulls together some of this data and and if you're designing a survey can you design it as well with these kind of data collection in mind as well um beyond your immediate um uh immediate uh use um and this might be i mean it might be a question for for, for george in thinking about the, the surveys that you design with the jolsoc but maybe you just design that with the jolsoc in mind i don't know um did you did you think about um archiving the data or sharing the data um we did a a, a write-up on the website kind of with a, an overview of the demographics from the membership survey uh the edi demographic data we've got from hisa which is the higher education statistics agency in the uk where we sign you well you purchase the data, then you sign a licensing agreement, which kind of hinders what you can do with it in the public domain. So um, whatever we do write up and place on, in the public domain, so it'll be our website or our magazine, um, we will have to suppress some of the numbers to avoid, um, I suppose, reneging on the contract that we signed with them because um, I suppose, you know, some subjects have very few people in them. So I think the fear is that, you know, they could potentially be identifiable. And now with GDPR in the UK and uh, data protection around protected characteristics, uh, that's become much more of a concern. So, yeah, there's a lot more to think about. If we purchased this data what, before GDPR came out, we could just throw it all <laughs> on the public domain and it would have been freely accessible to anybody in the community but now unfortunately we can't do that and fair enough that makes sense but yeah it is it's a difficult one um i mean we plan on uh developing two reports on both of them and putting as much information that we can in them so the community can access and use it themselves but at the same time we have to be mindful of the compliance I probably yeah. went off script there <laughs> no that's okay I mean the main reason for asking this question is just to say you know what do we need to think about you know how shareable is this or how not shareable is this data Jana did you want to did you want to add to that I do yeah I think George's points are, are very very salient and I think uh, uh, especially coming out of the European context, I, I know the challenges that the GDPR can also create. Here in America, we don't worry about that. We just sell everybody's data. <laughs> and, and that's why I get probably 12 robocalls a day <laughs> from random numbers in, you know, Westchester, New York and whatever, just trying to, and I got a text the other day offering, um, someone offered to donate their lottery winnings to me. And I was kind of thinking, you know what, this seems too good to be true. And it's because someone sold my number on, on the internet. That's what GDPR is trying to prevent. But in all seriousness, I think that, you know, the one thing I, I, I would say is ensure that anything you share is never identifiable, you know, take away people's, um, you know, when you get your, you export your spreadsheet out of, whatever collection mechanism you use, Qualtrics, SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, whatever, you know, take every identifi identifiable piece of information away that could include things like, it could even include things like country, it could include things like, you know, institutional affiliation, it could include, it could include, um, yeah, like location, email, and definitely includes email address, name, et cetera, et cetera, if you do collect those in your survey, which, you know, sometimes it's, in a lot of the time in my work, you know, we were evaluating the impact of a specific teaching fellowship. You know, we only send this to people who completed the teaching fellowship. So, you know, we do collect people's names and email addresses. But if we're going to release that anywhere, we, we of course, delete those columns from the data uh, from the data set, and we do not uh, we do not share anything that could could potentially 
be used to make a participant identifiable. So that's definitely the top kind of privacy concern. Um, and it's a privacy concern for all surveys, um, but there are definitely, there are circumstances where you collect that data and there are circumstances where you don't. Um, so I think that that's really important, again, not to collect things you don't need, but also definitely to, to de-identify uh, any kind of data you have. The other um, thing I would say is that at the same time, I'm a big believer in open access and I'm a big believer in making whatever data you have available, if it's feasible and appropriate to do so. You need to make sure that you have, um, you know, the kind of administrative clearance to do so. So if you're affiliated with the university, you'll often be going through what is called an institutional review board, which are the, the guys at your, at your university who kind of say, yes, this is what you can collect and this is how you may use it. So be very careful never to stray from, from that because you could compromise, you know, your ability to do that study or to do other studies in the future. It's really, really important to adhere to those rules. But, you know, there, there are definitely open access repositories that people could upload data to. Um, and you can simply, I, I, you know, listing them offhand, there's quite a few of them, but there's, you know, like the Harvard Dataverse and there's other places like that. You can upload survey results to that and allow other people to, to use them in the future, of course, citing you and citing your work. Um, so I think that that's really important. And where, where it's feasible, if you have a, you know, if you have a survey that you think, you know, people might if you have data that you think people could replicate and write something about it, do further analysis that you either couldn't or didn't do, if new techniques come to mind in the future, if people, if you didn't have access to certain software, but someone someone out there might and might want to do certain certain analysis, I think you know, uploading uploading your transcripts and uploading your your survey data sets, you know, that could be a really, really powerful thing that you could do because someone can come along and, and you know, use that and exploit it for good. And of course, yep. you know, if you're in an open access repository, you get cited. It's all, it's, it's all good. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, all, a lot of time to win win. All very, all very useful tips as well um, when it comes to thinking about where you can put your data. And actually, maybe I can point you, Jana, to our Padlet and you can maybe put in a few of those suggestions of potential different <laughs> data repositories or some of those points that you mentioned, because I think they'd be really useful. And you just, got it. just um, thanks, Jana. Just as we're starting to finish off then, um, I'm, I've noticed there's been quite a few um, um, good comments from, from Shruti, who was one of our, our uh, speakers this morning. And I'd just like to invite Shruti to turn on the camera and have some, some of the closing comments because I think she's got some some really important things to say to us here. No, thank you very much, do. Anna. This is this is really interesting. Um, so, so I agree with all of everything Anna and uh, George said is that really be very, very, very careful about the privacy and confidentiality of your respondent because they are your respondents that are doing you a favor by giving you their information. So please protect it. Be very careful about what your institutional review board or ethics commission say, ethics ap approval depending on your country says, and do not violate the terms of that uh, agreement. But if you do want to have, you may not, be able to share your data, but you can make your data comparable. So don't make up your own questions. Try to use the same standardized questions so that what you collect in one country is actually comparable to another country. So you can compare data in an aggregated format. So uh, that's all I had. Make your data comparable and compatible with other people's data collection. And I think Thank you. Well, in terms of the whole concept of like the data release and when's a good time and stuff like that, it is such a balance between, you know, in a university, some of our KPIs are around publishing papers and that kind of thing. So you want all the data to go in there, but then you want to release the data because it's a snapshot in time. So you, you want to get it out there as quick as you can to be as effective as you can, because it's only valid for that point or a little shortly after when it was collected. So it's a real tricky situation i think to consider i'm being really quick yeah thank you very much caroline i'm very conscious that we're now out of time but we've had a real whirlwind tour of everything data collection and analysis and um, what we can do and what we can't do with this data so thank you very much to all of our panelists i hope this has been useful to some people and i'm sorry we didn't have even more time to delve into the different types of data and what they've been useful for. But if you have any examples or, or experiences that you want to put on the Padlet, please do. Um, we're just going to 
share now the, the, the graphic uh, for the rest of the conference. So that is the end of session one of the ED conference. Session two starts uh, tonight if you're in uh, um, in UTC um, um, at 8 p.m. But with the different time zones here shown on the on, on the graphic. And when session two focuses on awareness in equity, diversity and inclusion. So please do um, log back in or if you're unable to, please do catch it on YouTube um, after the event. So thank you very much to all of our speakers and all of our panelists uh, and um, Caroline as our host this morning. And um, we'll see you all very soon. <laughs>